Well, good evening and welcome to a uh, formal city council meeting for December 20th here in the Harry E. Mitchell Government Center. For all those that are able, could you please rise? Join us a moment of silence first, then a pledge of allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation. All right. Next is council meeting minutes. Council Member Granville. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, move to approve items 3A, 1 through 3. Second. It's been moved by Councilmember Granville, seconded by Councilmember Keating. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. That motion carries forward. Councilmember Granville. Uh, move to approve items 3B, 1 through 10. Move to second. It's been moved by Councilmember Granville, seconded by Councilmember Adams. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All, right. All those opposed, same sign. That motion does carry. Thank you. Next item is reports and announcements. I'm going to come down to the podium. If I could, uh, Mr. Ortiz, if you can come down along with Gina Godby here and the Tempe School Resource Officers team. If you who are here this evening, if you all come down here. And I know Mr. Ortiz, this is familiar. You used to be, work here. Good to see you back. All right. <clears throat> How you guys doing? I think we have one Padre in the council. Who is that? Look at look at look at look at Navarro. All righty. Speak Up, Stand Up, Save a Life, an organization that encourages students to be aware of warning signs and to speak up to be trusted adults about things like depression, suicide, grief, abuse, and bullying. Speaking or standing up is the first step to saving a life. The students here today are able to save each other's lives. This great organization gives them the tools and the encouragement to do it. This organization has partnered with our local schools and our Tempe Police Department to enhance our existing efforts in this space. If you're interested in engaging more with their work, they are having their conference at Grand Canyon University in January. And that being said, I will now read a proclamation for them. In the states, the Speak Up and Stand Up and Save a Life movement presents an ide ideal opportunity to help bridge the gap between young people, our local community, government, and law enforcement in a positive way. Our local schools are facing preventable suicides and tragedies that may include warning signs in person or online, but bystanders or friends remain silent among the threats or cries for help. And whereas our young people can be empowered to report concerning posts of our community to school representatives or law enforcement, and adults can receive training to help spread the message that it is okay to care enough to speak up, stand up, and save a life. And whereas more than 3,000 Arizona students from 120 public, charter, private, and tribal schools have learned the message and created student-led impact projects in their schools and communities. And whereas Arizona schools, students, parents, educators, police departments, and community organizations are encouraged to coordinate a variety of awareness and prevention activities designed to make our communities safer and promote a healthy environment for all children and adolescents. Now, therefore, I, Mark Mitchell, Mayor of the City of Tempe, Arizona, do hereby declare as January 2019 as Speak Up, Stand Up, and Save a Life Month in Tempe, Arizona. Let's give these students a round of applause. You guys, please Thank you, Jesse. Next, if we could have Michael Levea from the Arizona Development Disabilities Planning Council, Dr. Risa, Michelle Stokes, our own Michelle Stokes, and Jenny Blusix, 
And then I know we have some uh, sign interpreters with us here today. So at the November 15th council meeting, council approved a resolution that was a grant of a little more than $124,000. This money was given to us by the Arizona Development Disabilities Planning Council for Tempe's Building Employment Support and Training Program, otherwise known as BEST. This program is a big deal because not many other municipalities are taking a leadership role on inclusion like this. The BEST program helps to create a diverse workforce and provide city employment opportunities for individuals with development disabilities. The money will help fund six part-time positions in the city and the program will overall will facilitate a municipal employment model. We are so honored to have the ADDPC support on this initiative. And if I could ask a representative, would you guys like to say anything about this? Please. Please, Erica. This is a microphone. <laughs> Hi, everyone. We just want to say how excited we are that the city of Tempe is doing this. They're going to lead the way for other cities in our state and across the country. Um, and we are looking at them fondly with what, with what they're doing. I mean, a lot of the people with disabilities that we work with, a lot of employers don't give them the chance. And so the city of Tempe is actually going to give them that opportunity and show others how to do that. So we have, thank you so much for putting, in a, for putting in your idea, and we look forward to working with you over the next several years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And per the city charter, um, I have made board and commission appointments this evening as part of the regular meeting agenda. Uh, with the help of my council colleagues, uh, council member uh, Adams and council member Navarro, these appointments are listed under 5A1. And I just want to point out that uh, one of the appointees is here with us in the audience tonight. Um, if I could ask Mr. Jeremy Farr to please stand. He recently retired from the Navy after 26 years. Um, he is a new member of the Veterans Commission. So thank you, Mr. Farr, for being here. And as I mentioned, he's a 26-year distinguished career where he achieved the rank of Command Master Chief, which is the highest enlisted rank uh, you can receive, equivalent to an Army Commander or Sergeant Major. After his service, he moved his whole family to Tempe. So thank you so much for being a part of this community, and we look forward to working with you on the commission. So thank you very much. And also, um, as I just mentioned on the commission appointments, I uh, have made an additional appointment to the 2020 Census Complete Count Committee, which is also on the agenda under 5A1. That will conclude my remarks. I also, I failed to mention, I, I, I couldn't see with all the lights. I think uh, Justin Stewart is in the audience. We have uh, appointed him to the Arts Commission. Justin, are you here? Where are you? There you are. Thank you, Justin. All right. Mr. Manager, do you have any announcements? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. I do have a, a few announcements. First, I'm very pleased and very excited to present to you all tonight the Strategic Management Intern Program. This is the inaugural program that was run by our Strategic Management and Diversity Office. Uh, it involved uh, interviewing and selecting a number of interns uh, to fan out across our entire organization and work with departments on an intensive basis over a number of weeks to help them uh, achieve their uh, performance measures that they have created in order to better achieve Council's goals and strategic and strategies. Um, we have asked 
a couple of them tonight to come forward and present what they presented at the end of their uh, projects uh, to staff uh, for you to see tonight. We're also going to run a brief video that was created by one of the interns who's also here tonight. So let's go ahead and, and roll that first, and then we'll ask uh, the presenters to give brief presentations. Thank you. Andrew Mooney and my project is Disability Social Inclusion Metric Development. My name is Austin Puente and uh, I'm working on the Capital Improvements Budget uh, Data Analysis and Recommendations Project. Uh, my name is Dan Petty and I'm an intern with the Patient Advocate Services Program. My name is Kelly Hyde and the name of my project is Asset Replacement. I'm Kendall Bunek. I'm doing the Strategic Management Performance Portal. I'm Lucy Johnson and um, the project I'm working on is the International Green Construction Code Green Building Education Program. Hi, my name is Mark Torrance and the project I'm working on is Strategic Management Digital Engagement. My name is Raquel Torres and I'm doing the Grant Standardized Reporting. Uh, my name is Sam Gimmon. I work with the Park Assets Project. Hello, my name is William Chengo. Um, I was hired as an intern by the Strategic Management and Diversity Office to work on a project called uh, Youth Safety and Juvenile Crime Diversion Metrics and Strategies. What surprised me most about working on this project is by far uh, the performance measures that the city of Tempe has put forward. One of them that really stood out was the quality of life performance measure. I just think it's, it's not as common to see quality of life, a performance measure like that, put so high forward. Uh, my normal day so far has been doing a lot of research, looking at how other cities are doing their park inventory, or how forestries are sampling large tracts of land. I'm trying to get a sense of what it's like to work with real world data in a real world situation with real world needs. Um, school data sets are always clean and tidy, and there's the, ins the, uh, the answers are always obvious. Uh, here, they're not. Um, so just getting that kind of experience is what I'm looking for. Tempe welcomes you as you are. I think that phrase really reflects the project that I'm working on with trying to make Tempe a more inclusive environment by saying that it's not what the person is coming in with, but it's how the environment is coming to the person. And I really love learning so much, and so this opportunity with this internship program was just very exciting to me um, So I welcome new challenges, and I look forward to learning as much as I can while I'm here. The creator of that video, Mark Torrance, is here. Mark, can you always stand up and be recognized? I'll go ahead and ask uh, Dan Petty to come down and give his presentation about Patient Advocate Services Data Analytics. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Uh, my name is Dan Petty. I'm a senior in stats at ASU. Uh, I want to thank everyone for this opportunity. Uh, it's been an honor and privilege working alongside everyone. Uh, they tell you that math opens doors in life, but I didn't think fire trucks were included in that, but uh, here I am. I can give a five-minute spiel alone on what Patient Advocate Services does, but in a few sentences, uh, as you guys are familiar, patients who frequently call 911 for uh, chronic, uh, non-emergent uh, medical issues aren't well served by fire crews. It's just a mismatch of resources. Uh, so PAS takes referrals from fire crews uh, and others, assesses the patient's needs, and it refers them to appropriate community resources like SAIL, TAROS, providers of palliative geriatric care, and assisted living uh, facilities. Uh, at the start of my internship, uh, to get an understanding of the frequent caller uh, situation, I analyzed the data that stored in uh, image trend, which is the software used by the department. Uh, unfortunately, the default is to create new patient records for each incident. So frequent callers have a lot of uh, separate records. Uh, to find an accurate number of uh, unique patients, I uh, use that site software to group patients by date of birth and then groups very similar names together. Uh, in a moment here, we'll see the overall picture for 2017. Those are all the unique patients. Uh, uh, the, the sliver in orange there, those are, are ones with multiple incidents in a single year. And the tiny, barely visible sliver in red there are those with five or more incidents in a single year. So what kind of impact do those patients have overall? Uh, those with multiple incidents account for a third of all EMS calls. Uh, those with five or more incidents 
uh, are accounted for 10%, and foreign individuals alone accounted for 1%. So what attributes uh, indicate someone is likely to be a repeat caller within 30 days? Uh, using a regression technique and machine learning tools, I identified several factors that are familiar to all fire crews, but by far the most important factor in predicting whether or not someone is going to call again within 30 days is having a prior incident in 30 days, which seems obvious in hindsight. Uh, with that in mind, I created a report, uh, an image trend based on date of birth, that identifies those who would call twice or more within a week. And I'm proud to say this has identified several patients who otherwise would have been overlooked. Uh, PAS has been able to reach out to them and help them. Uh, finally, I've been tasked with assessing PAS performance measures. Uh, on the website, it's listed as a 90% graduation rate. Uh, I believe the language is shifting to uh, discharge rate. Uh, that's an improvement, but it's still problematic. Uh, being discharged from the hospital is black or white. You're either on one side of the door or the other. Uh, I think uh, having read nearly all the PAS visit reports, I can tell you there's a lot of gray. I think a more important and appropriate uh, measure would focus on the number of referrals to outside programs and uh, outside resources. Uh, first, it, evol it, it avoids the problem that's inherent with percentages. The community is better served by a 50% discharge rate of 100 patients than 90% of 10 patients. Second, establishing a baseline of how many referrals have been made, uh, that's doable. Uh, I'll finish that today, actually. Third, focusing on a total number of referrals encourages seeking out additional patients and additional resources. I was asked uh, to, to describe what I'm going to take away from this, uh, from this internship, and the answer is a lot. Uh, but I'll leave you with a story that's going to stick with me for a long time. A few weeks before I came on, uh, on board, a fire crews had gone out multiple times uh, to a young man, an ASU student, uh, for anxiety issues. And the, the crews knew that uh, he had a friend who had recently passed away uh, of an overdose. They didn't want to see him fall down the same path. So in an act of compassion, they reached out to PAS and asked, well, what can you do for this young man? And PAS mentioned it would talk to him, and he said, all things have changed at work, and I lost my insurance. Uh, subsequently, I've fallen behind on my rent, and I'm two weeks away from being evicted. And I don't really have a, a network to rely on here in town. And on top of all that, he was HIV positive. I can't imagine what I would do if I woke up in that young man's shoes I think you, know, you, you start a GoFundMe page and hope for a miracle. But PAS uh, reached out to uh, the Area Agency on Aging, which has a uh, relationship with the Ryan White Foundation. And within a few days, the Ryan White Foundation uh, had a caseworker working with him. Uh, they paid his back rent to keep him from being homeless. They connected him with a job, with uh, insurance, so he can continue taking his medication. And they connected him with rehab and with counseling. All those resources were out there, just waiting for him. Someone just had to make that link, and that's what PAS does. Uh, in the end, he didn't need a miracle. He just needed an advocate. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, and I, I think I can safely speak for Chief Reese and all the staff there at Fire Medical Rescue Department of how impressed they were with him and and his uh, great work that he did during the semester. Um, next, I'll invite up Alexander. Before you, or, Andrew, yeah, before you do that. Is there any questions? I'm sorry. Yeah, Mayor, Mayor thanks, City Manager. You know, just briefly, I, I know this program also well, and being in the fire department at AMS, but the cost savings that just you navigating that person to the right appropriate location, giving the right appropriate help, and doing those resources is tremendous on the system, tremendous on the healthcare system <laughs> by far. The 15% the of the repeat callers to call 911 over again, almost bill about half of the uh, medical bill out there. So this service, I know, is going to be um, highly looked at. And nationally, other fire departments are doing this, but I'm so proud that Tempe is taking part of this um, because of the service and because of our aging community. Not only that, because of all the different uh, entities within our community. It's just, just like you said, they need someone to advocate for themselves. They need someone to be there to get into the right location. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll go ahead and call up Alexandra Mooney, who will present on disability social inclusion metric development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for having me tonight in the commission. Um, I've really enjoyed the internship and all I've learned and working with Michelle Stokes has been a great experience. Um, so I'm the strategic management intern for disability social inclusion. 
So I'm currently a sophomore at Arizona State University and I'm studying elementary education. And I'm also obtaining a certificate in the cross-sector collaboration uh, school. And so I'm planning to go into teaching, but this internship has been a great segue to learning how public policy works, how my city works in their own government and things like that. And I hope to go into policy one day. So an interesting quote I picked out that uh, reminded me a lot about my project was, when everyone plays, we all win. And this came from a Christmas commercial, actually, from uh, Microsoft. And what this quote is saying is that the only way that we can prosper as a society is if everyone can participate. And that's basically what this project is. It's looking to make sure that every citizen and resident within Tempe is able to participate and strive in our different city events, programming, transportation, everything like that. So let's take it back to the 1960s. Uh, these are a couple pictures I grabbed from the Ability 360 Resource Center, an independent living center. Um, and so these are a couple individuals sitting outside of the Greyhound buses and also on um, the Capitol building. And there was no ramp for them to get up to the Capitol to speak their mind, so they crawled up. Um, so the fight for disability started long before my time, long ago. But now in 2018, we're still fighting for those rights. So the beginning question that I asked myself when looking at these metrics was what metrics can we develop to measure how Tempe is increasing social inclusion, people with disabilities, while decreasing isolation and poverty. And that isolation and poverty piece was really important for looking at metrics that are actually going to be effective and possible. So a little bit about my project. I started off with 10 different areas of inclusion. And I then narrowed them down to five areas. So the five areas are transportation, employment, equality, programs, and events. And from those five areas, we created five metrics for each area. And then once those five were created, we narrowed them down to two different metrics to look deeper into. After that, we scored the results. And those scorings are going into an index that I'm creating. So a couple key activities we did is that um, I, visit, I visited Ability360, and that's the independent living resource center I talked about. Um, that was a really good opportunity for me to get to know people in the disability community, get to know the different resource centers that are um, resource abilities and opportunities that the city offers to residents. I also went to the round table meeting, and so that's where a couple uh, representatives from the city got to come in and talk about what they were wanting, what they were looking for for the city for disability rights. Um, I went to the commission meeting and I got to present there as well. And then I talked to city department representatives. And this ended up being a huge key point for me to do um, because that was a point where I had a really super rough draft of my metrics and I was able to get some really good feedback about how I can move forward and edit those. This is a little look into what exactly I'm making for this index. Um, so it starts off with a metric. So one of the metrics I created for transportation was the percentage of fixed bus routes in Tempe that do not exceed a 15-minute wait time. This metric came from uh, some of our residents who are maybe quadriplegic or have other kind of disabilities that um, cause them not to be able to sit outside of a bus stop for more than 15 minutes. And it seems very simple, but it could be a huge health concern for some people. So we recognize that we got this, uh, this data from Valley Metro, and this is public data. Uh, and then it's also going to be a percentage. So the way that we're looking at it is the routes under 15 minute wait time in all Tempe bus routes. And of course, we hope to see that percentage increase over the next couple of years. Yes, we have one question. Sure. Quick yeah. question, does that include the orbit route system or just? Um, it includes everything, yeah. So it's including uh, paratransit systems, oh, um, the broker system, orbit, all the above, yeah. Thank you. So a couple of challenges, of course, came along with this uh, project. So, of course, it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of project. What might work for one person probably doesn't work at all for another person. And although that was a challenge, it made it really interesting to get to know the disability community and to reach out and meet people to see how I can best make metrics that do fit for more people. Another one is that data is difficult to collect. I'm sure that we all know that uh, disability research is not being done and it's not being measured. And so uh, Michelle and I have identified that measurement equals importance. And so. That's something really cool that Tempe is doing, is that they're measuring importance by creating this data. And then marketing, of course, doesn't find everyone. So it's hard to get surveys and different data that way. So a couple takeaways. 
Uh, Michelle always told me nothing about us without us, and this retains to no one should be left out of the discussion. Uh, this was how I mentioned earlier about uh, Disability 360, going and meeting people in the community, making sure that the work I've spent the last 12 weeks doing is actually going to be effective going forward. Treating everyone with uh, respect and grace. Disabilities can be gone uh, unseen most of the time, so you never know that there might be a hidden disability someone has or someone's just having an off day. It's always important to treat everyone with the respect they deserve. And then lastly, the another piece that measurement equals importance. This is a really important project to me just because it's showing that as a city, we care about our residents with disabilities and we care about making social inclusion a bigger possibility for them. So one last thing, as uh, you've seen in my video that Mark made, that um, a cool thing that I saw every day going to my office was this sign that Tempe welcomes you as you are. This is what my project is all about. It's all about that people come into our city and we welcome them however uh, size, shape, and form they're coming to. And we're going to make uh, Tempe a city that interacts with them in an effective way. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Alexandra? No? No, that's great. All right, thank you. Uh, before we conclude, I just want to, you know, this was the brainchild uh, of the uh, Strategic <laughs> Management Diversity Director, Rosa Chowsky, but also uh, really implemented incredibly well by Waddell Holmes, who's here. Thank you, Waddell, for all your work in putting this together in this inaugural uh, grouping of, of, of strategic management interns. There will be another uh, group who will be coming in in the spring semester, and we're anxiously awaiting their results as well. Um, Mr. Mayor, Member Council, before I conclude my remarks, I do want to uh, conclude with the following, and that is we are honored tonight to have uh, Jerry Hart here for his last City Council meeting as a City of Tempe employee. Jerry has served the City of Tempe for 30 plus years, and he is retiring. Um, you know, there are, uh, at least in my experience working here at the City of Tempe, a lot of really good employees who are just experts in what they do. Uh, and there are also a lot of city employees who are just incredibly good human beings, just outstanding people. And then there are people like Jerry, who are both <laughs> those, who are both outstanding in what they do, who are outstanding employees, but just incredibly outstanding, good human beings who just are absolutely admired by everyone that they have, have touched in uh, their years working here. And I think that really sums up uh, what I and many people feel about Jerry Hart, uh, who has always been here and has always placed his service to this city above all else. Um, in, in good times and in difficult times, Jerry has always been just a solid uh, person for all of us, and we have relied upon him and his leadership on so many occasions, and we're going to miss him very much. But we know he's going to really enjoy retirement, and he certainly has earned it. And so on behalf of the City of Tempe, uh, Jerry, Hart, thank you so much for all you've done for us uh, over the last 30 plus years and all the best. So thank you. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you. All right. Next item on our agenda is our consent agenda. All the items listed on the consent agenda will be considered as a group and will be enacted with one motion by the City Council unless an item is removed for separate consideration. Members of the public may remove public hearing items for separate consideration. Public hearing items are designated by an asterisk and council members may remove any item for separate consideration. If you do wish to speak uh, on a public hearing item, please fill out a speaker's card, which can be found in the back of the council chambers and please give it to our city clerk staff. And I'll call your name uh, when it is your turn to speak for public comment. Uh, miscellaneous items, 5A1 through 5A7, awards and bids of contracts, items 5B1 through 5B8, and resolutions, items 5C1 through 5C3. Again, any agenda item that is marked with an asterisk is a public hearing item, and it can be moved for, removed for separate consideration. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to have any of the items I just read uh, removed for separate consideration? Could you please get my attention? We do not have any cards. Seeing none, I close that portion. I look for my council colleagues. Is there a motion on the cassette agenda as read? It's been moved by Council Member Adams. Is there a second? Okay. Seconded by Council Member Arredondo Savage. Please vote. 
passes 7 to 0. The next item is our non-consent agenda. Uh, all the items listed on the non-consent consent agenda will be considered separately. Agenda items scheduled for an introduction and first hearing will be heard, but will not be uh, voted upon at this meeting. Agenda items scheduled for a second public hearing and final adoption will be voted upon tonight. Item 6A1, uh, 6A is miscellaneous items, biz, contracts, resolutions, approve a one-year contract renewal with United Health Care Insurance Company for a Medicare Advantage Health Maintenance Organization Medicare Supplement and Medicare Prescription Drug Plan for Medicare eligible retirees. Is there any comments or discussion from the council or a motion on item 6A1? It's been moved by Council Member Q or Vice Mayor QB, seconded by Council Member Granville. Please vote. That motion passes seven to zero. Next is item 6A2 is to award an 18 month contract with four one year renewal options for G4S Secure Solutions Incorporated and Allied Universal Security Services to provide security officer services at various city locations to be overseen by the police department. Um, if we could, um, if we could ask Michael Green to come down, Rainy Broderick and, and the chief uh, to be down as well for any comments or questions. Um, while they come down, I just want to remind everyone that back in October, after hearing from uh, many of our residents about an increase in illegal activity, the council approved a transferring of funds for a pilot program uh, to protect the investments of our parks. Uh, the chief of police and the PD brought forward this pilot to address the issues in our residents that we're seeing. Um, I did ask the police chief to, at our last council meeting, to uh, bring back in January uh, a two-month update. By that time, the pilot program were, have been going on for two months, and it was a program recommended by our chief of police and by our city manager. And then now I'll turn it over to Michael Green. Thank you, uh, Mayor, members Earth of council, Rainy Broderick, internal services director. Um, I will turn it over to Michael Green in a minute. Uh, but I just wanted to make a couple comments uh, so that we're all clear about the nature of this uh, agenda item. Uh, the city of Tempe has had a contract for security services for over 15 years. The current contract uh, is expiring now. Uh, and so following our procurement code and our practices, an RFP was issued. Uh, and uh, at this point, the purpose of the uh, RFP wa uh, was to communicate to the marketplace what kind of potential services or needs that we had as a city. It does not in any way commit us to any operational processes or commitments. Uh, it is just to have uh, the resources available for the departments uh, for the various security needs. So what was listed in the uh, contract or in the RFP and it's listed in your RIFCA document is just an example of where security guards might be used in the city. Uh, the other uh, point I'll mention is that it was, uh, we're recommending a dual appointment or a dual award really because it offered us some competitive pricing. Uh, and so that was the motivation behind that. So, uh, and Michael is going to give us a little bit of information about uh, the background uh, that is done, the review that's done when we go through the RFP process. Um, yes, uh, Mayor, Council Members, uh, Michael Green, Procurement Administrator for Tempe. Um, we, we, this was about a three-month evaluation process. We had seven companies respond. Um, we looked at a host of issues in that review, but specifically on the qualifications of the companies, we focused on some, some key areas, and we asked some questions of the firms when they submitted their proposals. Um, and so we looked at, you know, we wanted to make sure that they didn't have any defaults in their prior contract dealings, um, any bankruptcies we wanted to know about, uh, any use of force convictions that they might have experienced in their work. Um, we also inquired to understand better about third-party agency reporting agencies and what they knew about the companies. Um, and so there was a host of issues we looked at and, um, and, and verified where we could uh, and through the process to verify those reported, those self-reports that they did in their proposal. Um, and so we went through that process and um, you know, and, and double check where we could. And, um, and then we also uh, carefully contacted the references. We did ask uh, for five uh, current references from each company. 
and the top three companies that we evaluated, we did make contact on their references, and we were very careful to ask questions about their, the performance of the officers, if there were any abuse issues or um, concerns that the, the contact person could bring to our attention, and we did not. Um, I, I, I know um, this is not a public hearing item, but if it's the pleasure of the council, if there's anyone in the audience, if it's okay with the council, would you, it's okay to see if there's any public comment? Okay, is there anyone in the audience wishing to address us on this item? Um, you can do so now, just get my attention. Yes, please come forward, state your name and place of residence for the record. Yes, three. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and the, the council. Okay, I was not, uh, uh, my name is Mario Martinez and I live in Tempe. I was, I did not um, know that this is going to be, uh, the public comment would to be allowed. Okay, but I appreciate the opportunity. What I would like to say is I can, uh, as far as this program goes, I'm okay with what the public and the council decides. Okay, I think that there is a need for uh, uh, for security. What I would like to point out, though, that the critics, although they're entitled to, the cri uh, to uh, uh, criticize the program, that this program uh, with the armed guards has been in effect for a while. And so I think that it's, you know, I, I did not foresee the outcome, you know, the, the, the criticism, although I think it's always good to criticize uh, when you think something's wrong. And I appreciate that, okay? So I think on the whole, there's been good faith efforts, you know, by the council. What I don't appreciate is the lack of untruth uh, uh, by a uh, Kobe Granville. I think that uh, let's say he told the Arizona Republic that he did not know the guards were going to be armed. The guards here are armed. How could you not know that? I really think that he stretches his credibility on that point. Now, as far as the guards go, I think that um, the, uh, uh, we have to face reality. The, or, uh, the Orlando shooter who shot up, I believe it was uh, uh, described as a gay nightclub in Orlando, he killed about 50 people. Um, he was hired by, I think, GS4, and they said, well, it was a, it was a mistake. I think what the what the um, this program should do, the oversight, is make sure that people that have these red flags don't get through. And if you have someone that's fired for misconduct from some other job or something like that, those people should not be serving. But I, I appreciate the opportunity, the willingness of the council, uh, let's see, to look at this issue, get some input from the, the, uh, uh, from the public, and uh, whichever way the, the, uh, you go on this, I just, I just want to say I appreciate it. I thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience wishing to address us on this item? Could you please get uh, my attention? Seeing none, we'll close that portion. Yes, Council Member Keating. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, you know, I, so I read the, the story in, in AZ Mir, and I know that there was some, you know, factual uh, discrepancies there that staff has been working with the reporter, and some of them have been corrected, some of them haven't. But I did take the time to listen to um, the This American Life episode that was highlighted in that article. And I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think anyone that listens to that you know, episode of This American Life um, would be comfortable with awarding Allied Universal taxpayer money. So I'm going to just kind of lay out why I feel that way, you know, and this is not to make anyone look bad that's going to vote one way or another. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to explain why I'm opposed to it. And we're all going to vote the way we're going to vote, and we're going to be friends afterwards, but this is why, you know, I have an issue. Um, you know, essentially, so the, the company Allied uh, Universal was featured on an episode of This American Life, which uncovered patterns of horrific behavior um, from, in part, uh, supervisors at, at JFK, uh, JFK Airport. The story details overt racism in the workplace, along with a culture of sexual harassment and assault of women officers, often by the men that they report to. 
These behaviors range from propositioning female officers for sex and showing them pornographic materials in the workplace to denying them the opportunities to eat on a shift as well as basic bathroom breaks while working. One officer spoke of having to bring a coffee cup to her post to urinate in because the supervisor would not allow her to use the bathroom while on her shift. The same woman witnessed multiple male supervisors laughing as another female officer bled through her uniform during her menstrual cycle when her male supervisor refused to send anyone to relieve her. Even more concerning is there's multiple allegations of sexual assault of female officers by their coworkers and their supervisors, including one woman who was raped by a fellow officer and then forced to work alongside him every day after she reported the incident to the company and asked for reassignment. Multiple lawsuits eventually led to Ally dismantling the team of supervisors, but none of them were fired. They were just moved to other job sites across the country. Allied has refused to acknowledge any wrongdoing by their accused employees, despite multiple financial settlements in as many as 14 lawsuits over sexual harassment and assault issues and a $90,000 settlement over religious discrimination as recently as this summer. I listened to the recording of the CEO of the company, the same man who is still in charge of Allied Universal, defending his employees and denying any wrongdoing at all, making no apologies, making no attempts to, to we're going to change the culture, we're going to do A, B, and C, none of that. Honestly, this is just the tip of the iceberg. If you Google the company, you'll see the word homeless, and a whole new problem emerges. In fact, let me just share with you some of the recent headlines. Boston, uh, January 2017, after ugly homeless abuse scandal, TD Garden is firing Allied. Boston, March 2017, <coughs> security company and guard su sued over alleged assaults of homeless in North Station. Denver, May 2018, Allied Universal security guard at Denver Station arrested after allegedly beating a man in the bathroom. New York, May 2018, private security firm at homeless shelter facing 21 lawsuits over violence. <coughs> I just, you know, I, I just want to be clear that I don't, I don't think that Allied Universal represents uh, Tempe's values whatsoever, and, and I'm not going to support giving them a dime of taxpayer money <coughs> short of the CEO stepping down and issuing an apology to these women and a whole new culture come in and a whole new set of trainings come in. And this will be years to implement. The fact that this contract is lumped, it, lumped into a single agenda item along with G4S renewal, I don't really feel like makes sense. And once I'm done, I would like to amend the item uh, 6A2 to uh, simply renew G4S and consider Allied uh, as its own separate item. As we know, recent increases in our park security have resulted in a lot of concerns being raised by the community over the appropriateness of, of security officers. But I personally am comfortable with G4S. We have a long relationship with them. They've been working in the city for years, and there's been, there's been no incidents. Um, so I, I'm not saying like G4S has got to go. Uh, Ally Universal has nothing to do with G4S, and it represents a change in direction from our previous provider, which was just explained to us, uh, Allied, our team security. Apparently they were selected through the RFP process, but the RFP process doesn't measure things like corporate culture or alleged, you know, allegations of wrongdoing. And, you know, I think, you know, this is Tempe and it probably should. As far as I know, um, team security has done a great job for us on things like bag checks and event security, which is what we're considering Allied Universal for, and I have no reason to think they wouldn't continue to do so. Based on my research, we have every reason to think that we could have serious problems with Allied Universal. Uh, if it's simply based on cost, you know, I, I, would, I would strongly urge us to, to rethink our criteria. Obviously, we need to be good stewards of the taxpayers' money but we also need to be good stewards of our city's values. And that means spending a little more to engage with a company that we have a good record with that doesn't have this litany of, of, of abuses, then I think that's, that's money well spent. So I would like to, do I, so I have to make the motion now again? I would like to move that um, uh, an item 6A2 that G4S and Allied be separated into, into two separate items for consideration. I'll second. second. All right, that motion has been moved by Council Member Keating and second by Council Member Adams. Any other discussion? It's a, this is just a split to two items and two separate? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
If there's no other, there's been a motion and a second, please vote. That motion passes seven to zero. Now, any other questions or comments? Council Member Keating? I don't have any other questions or comments if my colleagues don't, but I'm not sure how to move we approve one and, and not the other. So, uh, Council Member Arredondo Savage? Um, well, just a couple things, and I, I appreciate the information that Randy's bringing forward, and I think it's something that we think we definitely need to take into consideration, and I don't know what the best method forward is to do that. Maybe we approve the GS4 and then table the second one. I don't know if it's time sensitive. Um, to, to send it back to, to uh, Mrs. Broderick and Mr. Green to see if there's some issues and concerns and then maybe they can readdress it in the future. Judy. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. I would recommend that the items be taken separately. Right. So a motion could be made either way on the G4S contract. And then after that vote, the council could move to uh, approve or not approve or uh, postpone or lay on the table as the council right. prefers. That was my suggestion, and, and I just was wondering, I didn't know if it was time sensitive in order if we did move for a postponement for the second one so it could go back to procurement. If that's the better process moving forward to relook at some of these concerns and take them into the equation. Um, yes, um, council member, we would have time to um, resolicit for the unarmed security officer services. They're primarily used um, for spring training support, so we would have to move quickly, but we, I think we can do that and come back uh, with a different, another recommendation. So would it be best then to, I would ask um, Mrs. Bauman to deny that or to postpone it? Because do we, in regards to moving forward, would it be better for us to make a motion to postpone it, to let them readjust it and come back? Or now that it's already here, do we actually have to take action on what's before us? Before they can go back and readjust, and before they can go back and relook at it, we would actually have to deny it. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. It is my understanding that you could postpone that decision and allow procurement additional time to take a look at that specific award. Or could we approve? Yeah. Wait, Councilman uh, Navarro, then Councilman Keating. Thank you. And we, we can vote on one of the contracts. So just for clarity, am I correct? Thank you. You are correct, no, Council Member. Not, These would not. result, uh, 6A2 would result in two separate contracts. Okay. And then this is just a sidebar. And, and to Council Member Keating's point on future contracts, uh, I, I believe we do need to have that discussion on if a company has allegations or has had lawsuits. Um, to be part of uh, any RFP package, uh, you know, as, as a disqualification possibly. Um, but I would like for staff to look in that for sure. Council Member Keating, then. I, I just have a question for Ms. Bowman, or, or maybe it's, um, yeah, whatever. Uh, okay, so I'll, if we, um, we split into two, we vote on one, we continue the other, that's my understanding is what's being suggested. Does that then trigger a new RFP process, or does that just give us time to maybe vote on this later? I mean, I want to I want to come back with something new because I'm not going to vote for, for all. That's yeah. fine too. That's fine too. Mr. Green, our council members, um, we, we do have the option of using G4S for the unarmed security officers, and I, I should have mentioned that when I spoke earlier. Um, they have been awarded for armed or unarmed, and so we really can move them in fairly cleanly to support the spring training module. Um, the, the reason we made the recommendation as we did was there was some savings associated with bringing on Allied, and there still might be potential savings with a, a, you know, another company. We, could, we, could, we would have the time to investigate that and, and move forward to that. Good question. Yes. Um, Vice Mayor? To that point, so when this RFP was issued, was it issued uh, with these two specific Coverages with including one, you know, at Diablo because this is to cover Diablo Stadium, right? Was that the specific um, request in the RFP? Yes, Council Member, we we did we we published the RFP to cover both all, all of our security needs re regarding armed and um, unarmed, and we indicated in there that we had the res reserve the right to multiple award to bring on a second company, um, but you know, as part of the evaluation process, G4S scored so high they, they're clearly in the top position on our scoring. Um, and uh, so, um, but um, can I say I I have a concern just in general about having um, officers at entertainment and sporting events. This seems to be a new direction, and I worry. I think it for Tebby Beach Park and the concert that was a year and a half ago, where there was a near riot. Uh, I want to have some really trained, highly trained personnel 
in those kind of situations. So is this the movement, and maybe this is a question for Chief Moyer, is this a movement towards having um, private security at entertainment and sporting events in Tempe, or is this just Diablos? Because I have a concern about that and why we shouldn't have um, our officers representing our public safety interests instead. Yeah, thank you, Vice Mayor. I'm Sylvia Moyer, your police chief. Uh, thanks for the question. This was solely for spring training at Diablo Stadium. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, we could consider in the future supplementing police officers with uh, security, mm -hmm. but uh, at this point, this is very narrowly focused on unarmed security at Diablo Stadium. And may, sorry, may I continue? Mm -hmm. May I ask why there, you think we need, is this purely a cost consideration that you're thinking of um, having security to ensure public safety at the Diablo Stadium? Already, wait, no. Councilmember, my understanding already, is... We already do have... We do. Team is there now. I thought this was... Oh, team security is there now? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Keating. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, so... You know, Chief, and just let me know if I'm understanding this correctly, because this is how I understood that kind of goes to the Vice Mayor Kruby's point, was that there's always been uh, private security there to check bags, check tickets, get you, get you in the park, that kind of thing. And there's also always been uniformed Tempe police officers at these games as well, providing, you know, that, that you know, additional, not the, the bagging check and all that kind of stuff. Is, is that the case? And if so, it sounds to me like we're not really changing anything. We're just we're not changing operationally. We're just maybe taking a look at changing the company. You are correct. Yes. Councilmember Adams. I want to thank Randy Keating for um, doing your research and finding out this very disturbing information. And I would encourage procurement in the future to uh, really check out these things to make sure um, we're not. Um, bidding on companies like this. Uh, also, so we would have two separate um, contracts. I mean, we will only work with uh, the G4 contract tonight, and then you would go back to an RFP and do a, a whole other process to replace Allied Universal. Is that correct? Yes, Councilmember Adams, that is correct. We could we could uh, issue a, a new RFP for that particular niche area for spring training. Yes. Okay, and then the G4 uh, that would not necessarily um, stop us from having park rangers or more police officers or um, police aides or things like that, right? It's completely separate. Yeah, Council Member Adams, you are correct. It would, this is giving us a threshold not to exceed, um, and we would continue with the majority of the work that G4S is currently conducting, and uh, the exploration, as the mayor referred to, the exploration of having G4S in our parks is included as part of this as to not exceed. However, we're going to report back in January our findings related to G4S deployed in our parks and see if it makes sense for us moving forward. Okay, thank you so much. Council Member Keating. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have another quick question. Uh, thank you for uh, indulging me. Um, could we not just award this to, to G4S tonight? Could we not say G4S is gonna do Diablo Stadium? Yes. Uh, certainly you could, and I think that what uh, Mr. Green was explaining is that if you move and approve the G4S contract this evening, that services could be extended to cover the Diablo Stadium, at least for a period of time, and then that would allow procurement to have additional time to consider other RFPs. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, you know, that would be my preference as opposed to a new RFP process and all that. Um, I don't think really need to go through that again. It sounds like we have somebody that we're all comfortable with. Because, um, I, I mean, no matter what, I am a no, hard no on Allied Universal. So if G4S is, is the obvious choice, uh, that would be my preference. Vice Mayor Cuby, then Council Member Redondo Savage. I know the RFP process does take some time and, and staff time as well, but um, considering the, the transparency of these numbers that we have here and the concern about the higher. Um, costs of team security, for example, who we have a very strong relationship at Diablo. I mean, perhaps issuing an RFP might encourage some other competitive bids, and we might end up saving money if we do issue an RFP. There's a potential there, anyway, not a guarantee. Mm -hmm. That's why I would be in favor of having it that part go out to an RFP. <laughs> uh, Councilman Mayor Donna Savage. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Oh. Well, just really quick, and I, I don't know, I'm sure Judy's going to give us some direction in regards to how the best method to move forward, but 
I totally understand and respect both perspectives here. I just know what it was like to work with team in the in the past, and I think you know they're a local company. They were really involved, mm -hmm. and I don't know what separated Allied from the rest of the pack either. So maybe there is an opportunity to 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 reel another company in to be able to work with the city of Tempe. So I'm not opposed to that. I understand maybe moving forward, you know, like Randy, like Councilmember Keating suggested, you know, temporary to, to do that. And I don't want to leave wow. spring training um, without anybody there because that's something that we've done in the past. I think it's going to be really important to continue to do that service. So like I said, I, I know we've had a good, good um, uh, relationship with team in the past and it doesn't mean that we can't build it with somebody else if it's not them I just don't know what that looked like because I didn't see how the bids worked out in this this particular particular agenda item so my thought would be to to separate and move forward with G4S and then work on um, yeah a new RFP for the other one if, if it has to be new I don't I don't know but I think our our legal would tell us that uh, vice mayor QB and then we have wait Judy first and vice mayor Thank you, Mayor, members of council. I was just going to mention that if there's an additional fiscal impact that um, is not reflected on the agenda this evening, we could certainly come back and supplement that for purposes of transparency okay. with respect to the award for G4S. So if, I think there's, is there a motion to award the contract with G4S and then come back for another, I, I, another I and come back for another opportunity for the Diablo Stadium? Mayor, members of council, we would separate the vote pursuant to what you all had already decided. So we'll first take your action on the G4S. That would be the first one. Correct. Vice Mayor? But, since we're talking about adding, potentially adding the G4S, um, adding the Diablo security, I just wanted to make the point that team security, if we're thinking of extending a contract, perhaps we should extend team security's contract with Diablo's because they're used to the, the logistics of that particular job and it might be I mean, to have bring G4S in to learn potentially this new logistics and then not use them, it just it creates some awkwardness and some trans, transitional you know, awkwardness. And then perhaps if we are, we already have an a agreement or a contract with Team Security, right? Yes, uh, Mayor, Council or, members, um, we do have um, a 90 day unilateral option on our mm -hmm. current agreement with Team. So right. we could extend that contract to the end of March. And that would cover basically spring training. And so we could utilize team in that respect. Um, and they would not be eligible for a price increase um, because the, we have a 90 day unilateral. So that would be a, it's a non mutual decision. It's well, a city to, decision. I mean, to me, that makes more sense than adding G4S into that part of the contract for a short time. Councilman Navarro. Thank you, Mayor. So with, that, with what you're saying, then that would give enough time to do another separate RFP. You do the 90 days, extend it past spring ball with team and then go out for a, a re, redo in the RFP? Yes, Councilman, we could do that. I like that. Councilman Granville. Uh, thank you, Mayor. It sounds like we're getting ready to vote, so I just wanted to speak briefly on this topic as well. Uh, first off, thank you, Randy, for bringing up the point. I think that pretty much excludes allied and done is done. Uh, the issue as it relates to team and as it relates to G4S, I, I, you know, I think extending that to 90 days is fine and figuring out the right way to do this. Um, my my larger issue is actually the uh, security in the parks still. Um, G4S is a great organization. I don't think anyone would ever say otherwise. I have no issue with them. I had a chance to go over the RFP. There's lots of good language in the RFP that unfortunately doesn't get widely discussed. Uh, things like um, that security officers are expected to have concern for their own safety, but to avoid all situations that have encouraged violence or abuse. Uh, there's a whole series of, of things uh, about how it's really, you know, not to uh, manhandle, coerce, or detain others, uh, that they have no um, policing powers beyond that of an ordinary citizen, which is a huge misconception that's gone around for quite a while. The, the document I, itself, I think, is fine, but I think it's a different kind of RFP uh, when you're talking about somebody at a ball game, uh, somebody working a metal detector, um, and a few other places versus having someone... Uh, in a park, interacting with the public as their primary duty. Um, and so the issue that I have with this is I really think that that part of this should have been a separate RFP that had some uh, additional requirements in it, training requirements, insurance requirements. Um, uh, and not to say that the things that in here aren't good or that G4S isn't a great organization, they are, but 
some of the fears that residents have had about <coughs> having uh, security in the parks could be, I think, aided by having a different RFP for the parks and by having residents and police and social workers and CARE 7 and others come together and talk about what that training looks like specific to the park situation. And candidly, in my mind, it might not be a security guard at all. It might be a social worker. It might be uh, someone doing homeless outreach. That doesn't mean we're not paying them. It doesn't mean they're not in the park full time. But I just, I, I think it would solve a lot of the frustrations if at least for the park side of it, we had a separate RFP that allowed residents and interested and educated individuals to come in and provide some input on what that training requirement should look like. Councilman Navarro. Thank you, Mayor. Um, to Councilmember Granville's point, you know, I, my, my understanding, and I'll have uh, our chief to speak on this, is that if security does happen in the park, they're going to go through an education of mental health awareness and homeless outreach and all these other benefits to get them to the right location or the right people if help is needed. We've done this before four years ago in Escalante Park where we had G4S security move to that park for the issue of we want to just, the residents wanted to take back their park. They want to utilize their park um, at times when, when they could, but the fear was uh, they felt intimidated. Um, because there was a lot of homeless activity, so they did not engage. When we put security in there, it wasn't to brush or scare homeless away. It was actually an, almost an outreach for that purpose. But the, on, on top of that, it added a security element. Because there's a community center there, because there, um, there are activities that do happen within the parks that, frankly, are illegal. Um, so they are an extension of the police department, and they're going to be uh, also an extension to their um, capabilities through radio traffic and other needs. But they do have to have um, the training in the background, and I believe I'm correct on that, um, to make sure that they're doing things appropriate and it's on the up and up. I, I don't think Tempe is going to stand for uh, anything um, but that, because as we had a presentation with our um, uh, uh, patient advocate services, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to find extension of help. We have homeless courts. We have all these veterans courts. We have drug courts. We have all these things that we're trying to achieve to get the people to the right place. I think this is very appropriate with the appropriate training to have security guards within our parks um, to as a pilot or as a, as a pilot we're, we're testing um, to make sure that we're doing it right. And I think this is a tremendous idea. And I don't know if Chief can. Before you do that, I just want to remind what I mentioned earlier. This is something that, you know, at the last meeting, I asked the chief if she could come back with an update, a two-month update of the pilot program that the chief and the city manager recommended for us. And that's the discussion habit at our, our next meeting in January. This, what we're talking about tonight, really is the overall security for the entire city that we're talking about. And, and, but we're also, the habit of this, and the chief can ex elaborate even more, which she's going to do in a second, to explain that this has been a pilot program. This is... What's happening in the park is, is a pilot. It's, it's just a, a gap between now and the end of the fiscal year. We have a budget coming up in, in, in March. And then we also have next month um, an update from the chief on this pilot program to answer any questions that we may have as it relates. This is also entirely for the entire security for the entire city in addition to our police force. Councilmember Keating. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And then, um, <clears throat> chief. Well, and Councilmember Arnado Savage. Two okay. hands. I got her. Um, okay, you got her. Um, just looking out for you. Um, you know, I, I agree with you know everything you said. Uh, I, you know, I Councilmember Granville brings up you know real concerns that that are going to be addressed. But it, you know, as my understanding, when we did the park security the first time around, this is a stopgap type of situation, and then we're going to deal with this in the budget, whether that's park rangers or you know uniformed officers. You know, this is a solution, or this is just to get us from from one point to another. And I'd like to see that process play out. Uh, before we start looking at alternatives to to um, you know park security, Councilmember Arizona Savage. Yeah, Mayor, I don't want to beat it up, but but I do think at the same time I think there, we're talking about kind of two separate issues here, and I think I know because I had the same concerns that Councilmember Granville did that it was actually in the RFP, but I understand why it was in the RFP because you've got to be able to send out the RFP that's equal for everybody to be able to respond to, and so to be able to do that, you've got to give them kind of a view of what the expectations are and how the operations are today. That doesn't mean that's how the operations are going to be in two months when the chief brings back her recommendation as how we move forward with park security. So 
I mean, I, I just want to say I appreciate um, the staff doing what they needed to do and giving me the information so I feel comfortable moving forward um, with your recommendation, but also understanding that this isn't the last that we're going to hear about park security and what that looks like in the future. It may be something completely different, and I welcome that conversation when it does. I just don't want us to get lost in the weeds that we're really talking about kind of two separate things. Councilmember Adams? Yes, Chief, uh, could you give us a little bit of update as far as activating Escalante and, and what's happened as a result? Just sure, so uh, thank you, Councilmember, and all. So I will attempt to package this in a way that addresses all of the concerns in, into a simple presentation statement. <laughs> uh, some of what has been offered is, is uh, specifically about G4S and our use of G4S in the parks and as has been surfaced here, the mayor has directed me to come back with an update in January. So some of this you will hear again. But uh, what we found, our local experience with G4S has been uh, exceptional. G4S has proven and demonstrated that they have very high standards for hiring, for training, for certification of the men and women that serve in their company. That is our local experience. Our local experience is also that where they are deployed, it is not uh, new or novel. It is an extension largely of the work that they traditionally perform and have performed in our community for quite some time. G4S has demonstrated that if we have any concern as the agency that oversees the contract, they are incredibly responsive, they address our concerns, and they address it swiftly, decisively, and aligned with our values in how to engage with their employees and with the high standards that we have in Tempe. That has been at Escalante and elsewhere. It's important to note that because it was raised, uh, our community spoke and said that they were not feeling entirely comfortable in the parks. We came before you and we came forward with a recommendation that we deploy G4S in a unique and enhanced way. And this is what we did. We told G4S <coughs> we wanted to extend this for a brief period of time and examine if it, was, it met the requirements that we have for deployment in the parks because that was raised. Our team assembled the G4S folks for two days of training. And let me highlight what the G4S employees went through in terms of training. Day one was La Frontera Impact Mental Health First Aid Training, an entire day. Day two, reinforced the purpose, mission, expectations, code of conduct for G4S folks in the parks. Our prosecutor, uh, trained the G4S staff on documentation and how to perform as a good witness should a criminal case come before them. We discussed and trained on implicit bias. Human Services, our outreach team and CARE 7 spent considerable time with the staff and they even had working lunches where they went out into the parks and they met with folks and with a, a gentleman that was previously homeless who walked them through the park. So they had a real understanding of the space in which they'd be engaging with people. And we had uh, ASU presented on how G4S should engage with those that are suffering from schizophrenia and other mental oh. health conditions. They also went through scenarios at various parks, uh, applying their learning from both days and I can report out that our staff said that the team that G4S sent for that training and that has been deployed in the parks has performed uh, exceptionally. And they recognize what's needed to maintain our trust and the trust of the public in Tempe, and they have exceeded our expectations at Escalante and the other parks where they've been deployed. So at this point, we don't have data to present you. It is a separate, distinct point from this contract. But it's important that you know and that our entire community knows that G4S has, has deployed people into our parks and other spaces in ways that has really exceeded our expectations. Thanks so much, Chief. Yes. Councilman Grandel. I mean, Councilman Keating. That's the second time today, I, Mayor. I was just looking at Councilman yeah. Grandel. He was uh, getting my attention. Uh, you know, first, 
I just want to thank the chief and staff for taking the time to explain our options and you know helping us get to a, a point where I think most of us are comfortable. I would move that we approve item six two six a two as amended. Is that how I say it, Brigida? You've separated it out for the G four. Well, you've already separated it out into two issues. One is for G four S alone. I, I move we approve two G four S. I move we approve six a two G four S. Second. Been moved by right. Councilmember Keating and seconded by Councilmember Arredondo Savage. Any other discussion? Councilmember Granville. Yeah, th thank you, Mayor. First off, Chief, I want to say I uh, appreciate the, the work you've done. I have a great deal of faith in you and those who serve with you and your ability to train. Uh, and I certainly don't want to uh, give the impression that I've had anything but or heard anything but great experiences with G4S. It's been uh, glowing reviews all around. My concern has uh, has not been with uh, with with it's not even with having security in the park. I, the feedback has been clear that um, that the parks need new eyes there, new sets of eyes there. The part that gives me a little bit of concern over this is uh, it's an 18-month contract with four one-year renewals. It, it, it has the potential to be a relatively long commitment, um, although we can get out of it. Um, I, and and I'm, I'm on the fence on it because I have so much faith in your ability to train and to get people working. Um, it just, it inherently seems like a different thing than working a, working a metal detector or checking IDs. Chief, do you, you truly believe that, that G4S has the ability to do this and you do not have concerns about the interactions that'll happen in the future with the public? Is that, is that, Council I don't Member, want to put words in your Randall, mouth, but. Are, are you referring to the carve out for parks specifically? Yes. Because as part of this, uh, there's specific, I mean, there's a whole series of locations that we're contracting for, yes. one of which is parks. Yes. My preference would be that the parks part of it was a separate RFP that um, involved community individuals, whether that's uh, people who do homeless outreach, whether that's uh, mental health, so that we would all jointly put together that RFP rather than just the Tempe department putting together that RFP. That day is come and gone. Uh, and it doesn't seem like there's a support to carve that out separately and do a separate RFP using that community support. So what I'm looking for you is to basically vouch for this organization that you have a high level of confidence that there will not be an issue because I know you and I know that, uh, that, that I, I just know you. And, and I know that if you say you, you, you believe in them, I, I know to believe that. So what I can say with great confidence is that they have demonstrated that they have high values that our local contact uh, that supervises and manages the employees is responsive. He has high ethics. He understands the necessity of hiring, training, and- My question is really to the training as much as anything, Chief. Sure, I have, I have great confidence in the delivery and the folks in the Tempe Police Department who monitor the contract and continue to engage with the men and women of G4S I have high confidence in their ability to evaluate the effectiveness, the delivery, the values, the ethics of the individuals. Uh, I, I can tell you that I have high confidence. I believe that we've done as a team, the G4S hiring and the training team and monitoring and management team within the Tempe Police Department. I have high confidence that we would reduce the probability that there could be uh, an interaction that would would cause tremendous concern, but it is possible. I can tell you that I do have high confidence in their ability. And I know, and I know the service. RFP specifically talks about that their point is to just be eyes and to be, you know, to be a service. And so is, yeah, if, if you have confidence in this, then I have confidence in you, I guess is what I would say. Councilmember Council Kiwi. Yeah, to address Councilmember Granville's concern about the length of the contract and being, I'm really, um, perhaps too lengthy, I just want to point out that it previously was a five-year contract, so we're moving to an 18-month contract. That is a shorter term with four one-year um, renewal options. So that gives us time, and I understand there's close monitoring, and that's why we feel comfortable, or I feel comfortable moving ahead, because the local experience here with G4S has been a good one. Councilman Navarro. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, Councilman Grandma, I'm kind of confused because you approved having G4S security in Escalante Park years ago with the same purpose that we're trying to pilot in parks. I have to think you have confidence because actually it's proven 
what has happened in Escalante. Now, this is a pilot, and I do negative, good, bad, whatever. A pilot is going to get us data. Pilot is going to get us to where we need to be at a better point if needed. So I'm all for the pilot. I can understand your, your concerns, but we've done this before, and you voted on this before. You understood the last time that the needs uh, 4G for a security at uh, Escalante Park, and we didn't have this conversation then. Um, I know that this is a, you know, new issue, and, and maybe it's worthy to be on the news for sure, but other than that, I think the pilot and what we're trying to do here in Tempe and just try to advocate for not only just for security in the park, but for extending, extending outreach. I think this is outstanding. So there's a motion and a second. Let's please vote. That motion carries seven to zero. The second part of this motion, we do need to make it, we need to have a motion on the second part because we split the two okay, companies. Is there a motion or how we want to move forward with the second part? Yes. I just ask a Council question. I, I guess I, I just want to know because I think I, I feel fairly confident that um, Allied is probably not going to be moving forward. So I would ask procurement, what's the best method or legal? Is it better to vote no or is it better to postpone it? Thank you, Mayor, members of council. You <clears throat> certainly may make a motion to disapprove the contract with Allied this evening. You also have the option to postpone it to a later date. I know that. What's easier to staff? Yeah. What's easier to be able to yeah, rework the... Probably a definitive yeah. denial. Okay, thank you. That's all I needed to know. Council Member Adams has made a motion Again. to deny Allied. Uh, Universal Security and Councilmember Keating has seconded it. Any comments or discussion? Please vote. That motion carries seven to zero. All right. Next item, item 6A3, is to approve a two-year contract renewal with Worldwide Technologies for Cisco Networking and Voice Over Internet Protocol and Data Networking Equipment and Consulting Services that is used throughout the city. Uh, any comments or discussion for council or a motion on item 6A3? Bueller. Bueller. It's been moved by council member seconded. Granville and seconded by Vice Mayor Kubi. Please vote. That motion carries 7 to 0. Item 6A4 is awarding construction manager at risk construction contract to PCL Construction Incorporated for the Lime tanks, telescoping valves, and accredited. Uh, Equiduct uh, Improvements Project at the Johnny G. Martinez Water Treatment Plant located at 255 East Marigold Lane. Is there any comments or discussion on item 6A4? Uh, Is there a motion on item 6A4? So moved. moved by Council Member Keating, second by Council Member Adams. Please vote. That motion carries 7 to 0. The next item is item 6A5 is to adopt a resolution authorizing the mayor or to sign an intergovernmental agreement with the Regional Public Transportation Authority for the purchase and supply of mobility transit services for fiscal year 1819. It's been moved by Council Member Aridano Savage, seconded by Council Member Keating. Please vote. Go. Oh. That motion passes 7 to 0. Item 6A6 is adopt a resolution reauthorizing the mayor to sign an amendment to the intergovernmental agreement with Regional Public Transportation Authority for the purchase and supply of transit services for fiscal year 1819. Any comments or discussion or a motion on item 6A6? Moved by Council Member Adams, seconded by Council Member Granville. Please vote. You get, you take that motion okay. passes seven to zero. <laughs> the next section of the non consent agenda is ordinances and items for introduction and first hearing. These items will be read and introduced tonight, but no votes will be taken. The second hearings for these votes of these items is scheduled for January 10th, 2019. Can't believe it's 19. Uh, Item uh, 6B is ordinance and items for introduction and first hearing. Item 6B1 is to introduce and hold the first public hearing to adopt an overlay, or adopt an, oh, excuse me, an, amend, an ordinance for an amended planned area development overlay and to approve a development plan review for a new two-story, 70,000 square foot corporate office for Donor Network of Arizona, located at 2010 West Rio Slotto Parkway. The applicant is uh, Shepley and Bullfinch. The second and final public hearing is scheduled for January 10th, 2019. Would the applicant like to make a statement, or is there any comments or hangs uh, from the comments from the council? 
Yep, please come forward. State your name and place of residence for the record. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Mitchell and Council. Uh, we'll, we'll try to keep this as brief as possible. Uh, we believe what we're requesting today is relatively benign, but we also think it's a it's an opportunity to introduce a really exciting development and, and introduce the organization that's relocating here to Tempe. So with me today, we have uh, P.J. Garrity, who's a VP of Clinical Services for Donor Network of Arizona. I'd like for him to briefly introduce what this organization does and their mission. Well, Mayor and Council Members, the Donor Network of Arizona is the federally designated organ procurement organization for Arizona. So we cover the entire state of Arizona and provide organ, tissue, and ocular uh, donation and transplantation services for uh, all of Arizona, so for all the, the various hospitals and the five transplant centers in Arizona. We've been in operation for more than 30 years, and we've been in our current location in Phoenix for about 17 years, and our uh, operations have grown substantially, and we're looking to double our square footage by moving to this site. We're very excited to bring uh, 220 plus jobs to Tempe and uh, have a new state-of-the-art facility that will help us do what we do and to help save lives and make the most of organ and tissue donation. So uh, very quickly, um, we'll just, I'll get to the fun, the fun stuff. Essentially, what we're asked to be clear, what we're we're here for you today is to amend an already approved PAD and reduce the parking sir, requirement by, four, by forty spaces. That's me. Can you please state your name for the record? Oh, I didn't sorry, hear. sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> Joe Herzog with Shepley Bullfinch, principal thank architect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so, since we're reducing, we're asking for a reduction of the parking requirement of the PAD uh, from uh, 233 spaces to 184 spaces. The reason why is we're right-sizing this project, this parking lot, for a purpose-built building for a single-user tenant. And we've, we've hired traffic engineers to confirm our data, as well as looking at their growth projections. And we're very confident that we're supplying ample parking as designed, and if needed, if more parking is needed in the future, we will come back and actually build more parking. And so frankly, you know, from a design perspective, we were challenged to, on a seven acre site by our client, um, um, to, uh, which will be the, to design what will be like the crown, crowning um, building for the Liberty Center development on Rio Salado, Park, um, um, Rio Salado Parkway. Um, and it's next to uh, public transit, so we're confident that many of the employees will be utilizing that as well. So in the end, we're, we're designing a seven acre development of which over 50% of it will be landscaped outdoor, indoor, outdoor activity zones, as well as memorial gardens as well, that'll contribute to the mission of the organization. And I'll briefly show you, just to refamiliarize you of some of the neighbors here um, in the, um, at Liberty Center. And I'll just, you know, for your um, visual pleasure here today, we'll showing you what some of the uh, current uh, design elevations are. So this will be the street front presence, very lush landscape that not only surrounds the front of the building, but wraps around the back. We're, we're moving the parking to the back and along the building to create a nice edge along the, along the street. Indoor, outdoor garden spaces. Um, uh, and this, this is a view from Rio Salado Parkway. We'll actually have a garden for employees to, to come outside and, uh, and enjoy a, a nice days in the desert, wrapping around the building. And then the entry on the rear side, which will be, this will be where the parking lot engages with the building. And again, we're having more generous landscape islands than the Tempe the design guidelines even require. And those will allow us to create a, a, a seamless <coughs> kind of native desert landscape that'll, what we think will be emblematic of great desert architecture in Tempe. So with that, we look forward to coming back in January for our uh, final approval, hopefully, and uh, we appreciate any comments or questions at this time. Great, thank you. Uh, Council Member Arredondo, Sally. Yeah, just a couple of things. I mean, I am really, I just want to say, PJ, we are, I'm very excited for you to be in the city of Tempe. And really just three weeks ago, I was at your building in Phoenix I drove by there and somebody had pointed out and said, hey, they're coming to Tempe. And I said, what? That, and then it happened to see all this kind of come to fruition. And I, I was curious, not only excited about the opportunity, but will you be able to expand your operations of what you're doing in, in, in the building itself? Yes, so that's what you were goal. doing in Phoenix, right. Our goal in the, in the, the medium term is to, to do more of our procedures within the building than we can currently do in our, in our existing facility. As I said, this, this 70,000 square foot facility about doubles our space. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so we'll have a lot more flexibility in that regard. We'll be able to have more 
uh, clinical activities as well as more public, uh, public and, uh, educational events, things like that. Oh, that's awesome. I, I think it's really great, and I look forward to hopefully uh, creating even bigger partnerships with you in the in the future within our community. I think that'd be awesome. And I know we talked about reduced parking, and I think one thing that I, I would think my colleagues would agree on, it's really great if you could maybe work with our, our transportation department, too, and see if there, there's a way we could do, you know, maybe ride share or really just get to know light rail and, and different options so the employees can get to work, you know, safely and, and comfortably and hopefully get off the street a little bit. So anyway, I, I, I'm excited, so thank you. For, one, for choosing Tempe. Vice Mayor Kiwi. I'm also really enthusiastic about the project and I salute you for being forward thinking and, and looking at the reduced parking needs and um, you know excessive parking is a, is a problem in cities and we have a definite issue with uh, congestion on Rio Salado so thank you for being forward thinking. I would just urge you and I'm just based on the designs and looking at the, the images that consider to create as much shade as possible on the walkways to help with um, shade and comfort for people that are visiting your building and it may just be you know a function of the the image and I mean the drawing and not really what it's reflecting but hope that shade will be maximized at every opportunity so thank you hey we're excited so thank you very much we appreciate it this is only the first public hearing so we're not taking action on this tonight but thank you guys very much thank you Mayor. is anyone in the public um, this, this is actually a public hearing item. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to address us on this item? Could you please get my attention? Seeing none, thank you very much. Happy holidays. Next is item 6B2. is to introduce and hold the first public hearing to adopt an ordinance for a zoning map amendment and plan area development and to approve a development plan review for a single family residential development consisting of 82 story attached units uh, for the level located at 915 South Smith Road. The applicant is Earl Curley and Lagarde. The second and final public hearing is scheduled for January 10th, 2019. Mr. Earl, would you like to come forward and make a statement? Yes, Mayor, I would. Uh, for your record, my name is Stephen Earl. Uh, and for just under 40 years, I was pleased to say I was a resident of Tempe, which was a requirement, I think, for everyone who stands here. Um, <laughs> and if it were my decision, I'd still be a resident of Tempe. Sometimes wives make decisions that <laughs> husbands don't like. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so true. Uh, and also, as a point of personal pride, say uh, how much I am in support of the donor network uh, project. Uh, I had a kidney transplant 30 years ago, and but for that transplant, I would have not been here to raise my family or see my family raise their children. So I'm a big supporter of organ donation. Uh, as to the project here, uh, let me introduce you to uh, Ryan Larson. Maybe Ryan can stand up. He is a principal in Porchlight Homes. Uh, the other principal and one of the major principals in Porchlight Home is a fellow named Scott Peterson. I think it's important for you to know about this company um, as we deal with the planning aspects of this request. I know there's a major social issue here too, but <clears throat> uh, Porchlight Homes builds kind of a, in a niche market. They build single family, detached and attached in infill parcels. Uh, they have already, um, uh, over the course of their 10 years of life, built 19 subdivisions in most parts of the West, East Valley as well as Phoenix. And they have another eight underway. Uh, plus, Scott Peterson, if you don't recognize his name, was the um, area vice president for Delwet Homes for many years and built thousands of homes, as well as uh, Camelback, um, excuse me, not Camelback, but uh, Camelot Homes, who built the project at the southwest corner of Elliott Road and Rural which is now a great member of our community. So these people come to this proposal with great experience. Their desire is to purchase this site, subject to obviously the zoning that's being proposed, uh, and, and move forward to build ownership housing. I, we know that one of the major themes that the city has had for a number of years is we have enough rental housing, we need more owner-occupied housing. <clears throat> and that's what this project is. Uh, if I know how to operate this correctly. Uh, this first slide shows you the um, general plan for the city of Tempe as it relates to this site. On the left side of the, of the slide, 
you'll see that the uh, general plan would call for this property to be up to 24 units per acre and I guess potentially several stories. Um, we are developing at 12 units per acre, so about half of the density that would be otherwise allowed. Obviously, to the west of this property is an existing three-story apartment project, but to the east of this project is a two-story townhome project. Uh, and to the east of that is a kind of a apartment condominium project of some size. And then to the south <clears throat> is a Escalante neighborhood uh, that's been there for many, many decades, uh, a, a you know, major part of the city of Tempe. So we felt that our proposal for a single family detached townhome project that either had two units attached or four units attached was the right solution for this property uh, <clears throat> and would fit the general plan. This shows the environment in an aerial photograph and how our site plan would fit into this. You can see that this is a long, narrow site, so it's three times longer than it is wide, which creates a few uh, challenges for development. <clears throat> the main access for this project is off of Smith. Smith does not have full street improvements, which has been a challenge for the neighborhood because it does have a signal at Smith and University, but it's not a full intersection. This project would be required to make the uh, additional dedication for the full street and complete those full street improvements. The same would go for uh, university as well. <clears throat> when we held our neighborhood meeting several months ago, we, were, we did not have the corner, the immediate southeast corner of this intersection was uh, a existing commercial facility. Uh, you might have noticed there's a lot of cars there and things. We're not exactly sure what all the purposes of that property were, but we knew the owner wouldn't sell. Uh, but at the neighborhood meeting, uh, the staff was able to point out that any redevelopment of that corner site would likely require um, uh, right-of-way dedications. Um, and so he became more willing um, to work with us, but I'll just tell you that the price was still well above market. Uh, but, but it was in, an encouragement that we try to get the corner in, and we did. That caused the redevelopment or the project to be redesigned in order to include uh, the corner. Yeah. Vice Mayor has a question for you. About, yeah. the about the neighborhood meeting, I have a question about why the neighborhood meeting was not held in the neighborhood center, Escalante. Escalante Center was held at, on Rio Salado at a hotel and not in the neighborhood. Well, I don't know the answer to that question. We, we normally hold these, these neighborhood meetings at hotels just because we can count on the circumstances of the site uh, being ready for a neighborhood meeting. We didn't feel that it was too far away. It was just up literally going up Smith about a mile, you were at the hotel. Uh, so it wasn't a significant distance away. Uh, well, I mean, and just being respectful, I mean, if the single family neighborhood that is impacted by this development, the Escalante Center is right within walking distance and very close. So I would kind of counter that. Well, I appreciate the comment, uh, Vice Mayor Kuby. Uh, we did go door to door uh, in the neighborhood to the south uh, and in, in all of our interactions with them, we also had a uh, Spanish um, bilingual person so that they could speak to the neighbors to the south. And we didn't encounter anyone who opposed the request. All of the ones we spoke to were in support. I actually have a slide to that effect. So we had turnout from the townhomes uh, to the east, and they were supportive of the request. Um, and uh, we didn't have any uh, opposition at uh, either of the neighborhood meeting once they understood the proposal, nor at the Design Review Commission. Uh, <clears throat> so the next, next slide just shows one of the ways that the site will be improved. We're actually responsible for installing 104 new perimeter trees that don't exist there today. But most, mostly it will improve the appearance of Smith and University to have the number of trees that are being uh, incorporated into this, and most of them are there by requirement from the city of Tempe, uh, as well as the um, trees on the east side, which create the buffer to the townhomes that are literally on the other side of the wall. <clears throat> this project's main entrance is off of Smith, where you can see the uh, interior uh, amenity package. You can see that the units are in groups of four or two. 
uh, and there is a secondary access exit on University. <clears throat> this is shows the style of development that's around the property. Uh, this is the corner of Smith and University, so as you're looking to the um, what, the left side of this, you're, you're looking down University. Uh, very little of Smith is shown here. The staff asked us to improve the corner uh, architecture by adding significantly more brick, and I do have a rendering of that additional brick so that it improved the appearance. But you can see from this that there is significant articulation and move, movement of buildings and a, a fairly deep setback, which I have another slide of to show you the setback off of uh, University, which will have a bus pullout and a bus shelter. This is the entrance off of Smith. Uh, and again, staff asked us to imp improve this architecture by adding significantly more brick at this location, which we also agreed to do, and it was stipulation at the Design Review uh, Commission. This shows, uh, again, the relationship between units uh, and some of the amenities and the bicycle parking. This is just one of the driveways uh, to show how um, the driveways focus on the garage units. Each, each unit has a two-car garage. Uh, they have a little um, area in front and, and landscaping in, in, uh, around each side. This shows the uh, setback off of University and uh, the depth of that setback. We're between 20 and 30 feet away from the back of curb to the closest uh, wall. So that gives us an opportunity to plant several, at least two rows of trees and quite a bit of planting. And the entire corner is open now. Almost all of the parcel that was once an out parcel is now in landscaping or right away. These are the trees that have been selected for the project. Uh, these show about five years of growth or more. So they're not indicative of what they'll look like when they go in, but they are indicative of what they'll look like in about five to seven years. Um, and there are just a few uh, of the accent trees for, for palm. Um, uh, let me just uh, show you these uh, improved Appearances, the top one is the way it was before Design Review Commission. The bottom one is the improvement with the additional brick going down Smith and on the corner. The second one just shows, again, you can see the additional brick at the entrance and coming down uh, the street. So um, let me bring it back to this. Um, let me <clears throat> talk to some of the history because this property, as you all know, for five decades was a mobile home park. And we know that there is deep concern uh, by the council members about the displacement of uh, 42 um, mobile home units. So I want to tell you a little bit about Treehouse, because I think it's not entirely under, understood who they are and what they do. There's always a tendency to believe that someone bought this park to flip it for development. And Treehouse owns and manages uh, a total of 42 parks uh, in four states, 36 of which are here in Arizona. And they have never sold uh, a, or en enclosed a mobile home park before. So all the ones they own, and they've been in business for quite a long time, and they own, in fact, they own this site for 10 years. Their intent when they bought it was to like their intent for every other mobile home they purchased, which is to own and manage it over time. It's their business, and that's what they do. They, they found that it was very hard to continue to maintain this particular park. It's important to know that all the units that were in this park were owned by individuals, and what individuals then did was rent the space where they were. <clears throat> those units, I don't know if you had a chance to drive through there, but those units were in difficult condition. Because over time, unless there are significant upgrades made, they tend to deteriorate, and there were conditions that were below code. Um, now, you could say, well, the park owner is responsible for fixing those things. 
but they were owned by somebody else. So the park owner can improve the streets, they can add trees and landscaping, they can maybe add more, uh, more features at, in the park, but they can't, but anytime they do that, they have to raise the rent on the space to pay for any improvements they do. So it's a catch-22, raise, raise rents and make people very angry, or continue to do what you could to try and encourage people to move and then move in new units. Well, that displaces people. So they were caught trying to manage this uh, location for 10 years and ultimately found that it was necessary to actually, for the first time in their history, uh, ask for uh, the folks to be relocated. Uh, we were also, um, this process took uh, from, I think, about this time last year, no, November of last year, until August of, of this year. Uh, it went through a pre-notice, then there was the required state notice, there were a number of meetings held. We know that there are people that attended the city council and were very angry about how they might have been treated, and obviously the displacement of low-income families is a terrible human event. Uh, and the best that we could do, or Treehouse could do, uh, they're not associated with Porch Life, by the way, but the best that they could do is do everything that the state required and then go beyond that. Uh, and so they did. Uh, they uh, all, many of the units did not have clear title. And the reason that happens is because someone who is elderly may own it and then they may die, but they never properly got the title to their children or in some ownership transfer, the title was not proper. In order to move to a new facility or relocate your unit, you have to have clear title. So they worked with every owner to clear their title. And in some cases that required them to forgive all past rent that might not have been paid. So they went to a significant effort to make sure everyone had clear title. They also called the moving company that they themselves use when they're moving units uh, between their own facilities and asked them to help all of the folks who needed it because there was some concern raised that they weren't able to get with uh, the folks who moved these units. So that was done. Then they hired a um, person who was bilingual to go door to door and try to get everyone to understand what the options were. There are obviously monies available at the state, significant amounts for relocation. And, there, and I can tell you, that because they've given me a chart, and I can show that if you want on the overhead. Um, that's available. Uh, this chart, I'll move it up a little bit. This chart shows every single um, lot or, or mobile home, and I know it's very tiny to see, but every one is listed here. Uh, all the yellow is just me highlighting the fact that except for the ones that are in pink that were evicted from non-payment of rent over several months, everyone else was relocated to the new unit uh, and they got free rent before they left and they got free rent when they arrived. So the best they could do uh, was done. Um, the six that you see there had problems because they simply hadn't paid rent and they, in some cases, just left. But all the, all the rest of them were either relocated or they sold their unit and that new owner relocated the unit. So they were properly relocated and they did receive free rent, both from this owner as well as whoever the uh, place they relocated to. Could it have been done or, uh, been done better? I don't know because I, I wasn't there day to day but I, I obviously talked to the folks from Treehouse and they think that they went out of their way to make it as painless as possible, even though there were some who were obviously irritated uh, with that. Yes. Vice Mayor Kuby. Just, just to clarify the record, I, is there something wrong? Oh. Uh, just to clarify the record, I do want to say that our, our housing um, services department and human services were, had to get deeply involved in this issue to help, um, to help the residents to to reach some, not settlement, but to negotiate with Treehouse. I mean, it was a very difficult process, and I want to credit our staff for, for getting involved and want to make sure that we have that for the record, because it was not an easy process, and there was really 
very unfortunate communication um, from Treehouse. And, and I, I went to a number of the meetings and, and witnessed that. And I just want to have that pointed out. Vice Mayor Kuby, I couldn't agree more that staff went out of their way to be extremely helpful. I, would also, I was not at the meeting, so I can't speak with personal experience, but I have heard from you on a couple of occasions, so I know that the communication was difficult uh, in the early months, but that's why they hired a, a significant person who's well known to the city uh, to go door to door to make sure that that was properly done. And I can also tell you, because there was some concern about this at the end, that people would be thrown out before they could move. And I can guarantee you that no one, uh, that everyone who was there was allowed to take the time they needed to relocate their unit. Uh, so there was a deadline, but that deadline was moved off of uh, in order to make sure that everyone had an opportunity to move, relocate their unit, and be and have that paid for by the state fund. So, but I understand there was lack of communication, and I unfortunately I wasn't there. But I, uh, the folks have moved, and they are in different locations and parks where I hope they enjoy it better. Um, this park was very old, uh, and I think they've all moved to parks that are better. But I, I absolutely want to clarify that I understand that moving is very hard when you, you're used to an area, so there was a deep human event here. Now, that said, I've also been told by several members of the council suggesting that we participate in some workforce housing uh, uh, for this project. Uh, we learned of that request as a kind of voluntary, uh, a good faith cooperation, cooperation with the city uh, within the last several days. There hasn't been time yet to fully explore that, but I can tell you that Porch Light and Ryan's here tonight, we're making every effort to get in touch with and sit down and meet with the folks from staff, um, which includes our good planning director, uh, as, as well as others in the workforce housing uh, department to figure it out and find a way to see if we can uh, be a part of that solution. Uh, obviously, it's going to be challenging, um, but, but I can just state for the record, I don't have any details of that, but I do know that we will sit down. Apparently, it's probably not going to happen next week, so it'll probably have to happen in that first week of January. So. Beyond that, I, I'll just respond to any other questions. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Earl. Any other comments? Uh, yes, Councilmember Iridano Savage. Uh, yeah, just really quick, and, and Mr. Earl, I just want to say, um, you know, thank you for taking my call, and thank you to you and to Ryan. First and foremost, uh, Ryan, to wanting to be in Tempe. I always do appreciate uh, businesses, companies that uh, want to be a part of our Tempe um, community. So thank you for that. I look forward to hopefully um, um, being able to explore the opportunity to create some type of affordable housing tool within the development. I think that would be great. I appreciate you just e even inter entertaining the idea, working with um, LaVon, working with Chad and Ryan. Um, hopefully you'll be able to find something that we can all agree on. Um, because I do think you mentioned it, you know, when we eliminate the affordable housing, I think it's, you know, I feel like it's my responsibility to do what I can to try to incorporate as much affordable housing and, and in this case to me a workforce <clears throat> housing mechanism may be something that could be a really good perfect fit. So um, and I know you mentioned about uh, our staff pushing you on design and <laughs> I appreciate you being open minded to that and I want to say thank you to the staff for, for pushing for that. I do appreciate that. I think that's kind of what um, I expect that we want to get the most highest quality design that we possibly can. So thank you for, for making those changes and the adjustments. I think we're all going to be super pleased um, as things move forward. And I look forward to, to hearing how the discussions goes with staff to see what you come forward with um, at our next hearing. So I, I appreciate you taking the opportunity and the willingness um, to sit down and, and hear what we have to say and see how we can partner together. So thank you for that. Thank you, Councilwoman Eridendo Savage. Councilmember Keevy. And thank you. You've been very open in talking to me. We've had many discussions on the phone, and I really appreciate your willingness to, to discuss this and really have robust discussions. Um, I would just ask, with the design, if is it possible to look at some kind of permeable paving? Uh, I know that I imagine there's retention built into the design, but the opportunity for permeable, perme, permeable paving materials now in the, the drive areas might be explored. And, um, and just in in echoing Councilmember Aradonis Savage's interest in 
you know, affordable and workforce housing elements. I, I know it's, you know, difficult. It's not necessarily in a TOD zone uh, within a half mile. And I know that, what, what are the costs, uh, the estimated costs of the townhomes? You mean the uh, price? Yeah, sorry, the price <clears throat> to the... Uh, I can tell you that at, at the initial um, versions of this project, when we started uh, seven uh, meetings with staff ago, uh, they were in the 275 range uh, as the mm -hmm. beginning price. However, over time, obviously, we went through a series of refinements. Uh, we dropped our number of units by 10. We dropped the height from three to two. We had to buy mm -hmm. the corner. And in the meantime, of course, construction costs, if everyone knows, have, have escalated uh, exponentially. So it's now at the above 300, closer to the 350 range. Some might be slightly less than that, but that's kind of what's happened to us over the length of the time we've gone through the review process. And I know it might be a challenge. I mean, certainly we're not going to find an affordable by HUD definition um, solution there, and perhaps a workforce uh, um, workforce housing solution is possible. And we also know, you know, we can't require this of you. Uh, the state legislature, in their wisdom, has precluded that. There's no, there's a preemption on inclusionary zoning. Um, but this was, and I know you know this, this was the most affordable of housing. It may have been below code. It may have been a standard that needed to, to, to rise, but um, it was certainly the most affordable housing in Tempe and one of Tempe's poor areas. So if there's any way in respecting um, you know, I think it's in the public interest to look at incorporating workforce elements or somehow, you know, we have a housing trust fund that we're establishing. We have a, a goal to really uh, ramp up our affordable housing. So if we could look at some solutions, incentivizing that and some voluntary um, programs of you would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you. I, I just want to make a couple of comments. And I think uh, I want to thank you for your willingness to work with our staff <clears throat> with the recommendations as well as addressing the concerns as it relates to affordable housing. But one of the things that I don't want to miss is uh, the quality of the project in terms of, you know, and one of the things that we talk about is we're increasing, we're doubling the amount of homes here, which helps with the housing stocks, which ultimately you could say the more houses you have will help decrease sometimes the amount of the cost, which helps with affordability in some cases. Now, granted, this is a brand new project. This really fits in the need, in, in the desires of the councils in a lot of different fronts especially from home ownership opportunity. I know this is not going to be, my understanding, it's not for student housing, but it's, it's not. it is for ownership, you know, your professionals. This is a revitalized area just north of that. You know, we're looking at the Smith Industrial Park area, which is really makes sense with what we're trying to do for our entire region and really planning out our, our urban core. Um, you know, this is a little more than an acre of the property is being dedicated for the right of way for our transportation master plan improvements that will advance um, our strategic priorities that we have with transit, but also for Vision Zero, as well as the tree canopy that we talked about. You showed all the tree canopies. Um, I know you mentioned the history of this property as we all have a desire for affordable housing and workforce housing. That's something that's that's a priority for this council. And I want to, you know, and I want to encourage NIC Lamont and Paul and, and our staff here to work with this council because we're going to, as we can continue to move forward for affordable housing, you know, we can look at the bigger picture. We have a budget process coming up. We have been making progress with the direction that we've given so far as it relates to affordable housing. And the, you mentioned the nonprofit um, land trust that we just acquired. In fact, it's just been created, established for six months, and we've already acquired 20 houses and units. And we're going to be doing more of that in the future, I'm sure, with the work of this council and with our staff. Um, but I just wanted to say that you know, it's, it's a clear priority to the council. We're already addressing that, and we have a mechanism to do that. Through the, I know we have a budget process coming up. We have other opportunities I just mentioned the uh, Smith Industrial Zoning, but as it relates to this specific project, based on what you're allowed to do here, I, I just want to thank you for even even opening the opportunity to have consider um, options for us as it relates to affordable housing, but also in the landscaping, as well as helping us with the bus pullout that you put out there. And it just really fits with a lot of the area that what the council really, the priorities that we have. So thank you for that, Councilman Granville. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, one of the things you, you mentioned I, I want to chime in on as well, and that is the idea of adding, uh, I mean, one of the ways that you solve affordability is by adding supply, which, you, which you, and that's an, area where, yeah. that's an area where you and I absolutely agree. And I know um, we had talked in our meeting about uh, that your, your client had an interest, I think, although I might be misremembering, about uh, putting something in the CCNRs about keeping 
these in the supply. And by that, I mean not having them all become Airbnbs, in which case there would be no homes for sale. There would be no homes for even renting long term. Uh, and so it doesn't really add to the supply. I, I don't think we're, we probably can require that. I'm not even sure I'd want to. But, uh, but I know that was an interest of your clients. I was curious what the results of those further conversations were. Uh, Councilman uh, uh, Granville, uh, I apologize. Uh, I, I, well, I was looking at Kubi while I was saying Granville. Sorry. Um, <laughs> he did, uh, yeah, I, not like the mayor, I was looking the wrong direction. I'm sorry. I did discuss that with uh, the folks at Porchlight. And in all of the subdivisions, and, and as I said, they're all infill niche locations. Uh, they're not, they don't build 40, 60, 80 acres of housing. They build 10, 8, 7, that kind of thing. Um, but in the subdivisions they built, they do have CCNRs that prohibit the rent, rental of any unit for less than 30 days. Um, so uh, they're, they're happy to make that a part of the CCNRs here as well. I, I appreciate that. I hope that eventually becomes sort of a standard request for these sort of uh, home-owned projects for us. Councilman Navarro. Uh, Steve, thank you. I appreciate uh, the presentation and, and what you've done. I know this was a very touchy uh, issue. Uh, I'd like to give real big thanks to Councilmember Cuby because I know she was really involved in this and making sure that things were happening. And and at the end of the day, um, I think uh, you know it was it was done very well. Um, I also have to say, in one thing that the mayor didn't mention, though, the units that you are adding, the ability for families to buy um, a unit is the ability for more kids to go to the schools that's right down the street, which is huge for a population that's decreasing. And with the affordability part or workforce part, yeah, if there's something you could do, great. But that's not, uh, in my vision, you know, the, 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 the housing stock is so important for the city of Tempe because we go across so many apartments and, and, and just market rate apartments here and there and everything like that. The ability just to buy and own a property is huge for me. Um, I know within this area, we're doing a variety of different affordability down to the south, even just to the north, we're incentivizing um, workforce type of housing. So, you know, a, a diverse, uh, uh, um, you know, housing, um, you know, is, is already happening. Um, and it's not that I'm trying to make one area a certain um, um, category. That's not the intent. So I think this is appropriate. Um, I appreciate all the work you've done. And uh, this looks quality. I like it. Thank you, right. Councilman. Thank you, Mr. Rowe. Thank you. See you next year. <laughs> yes, <that's> next year. <laughs> All right. Next item is item six. Mayor, it's a public hearing if you want to oh, yeah. announce it, that, I'm please. Sorry. Thank you. I, I thought I'd... This is a public hearing item. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to address us under item six? Uh, B, or six B2, could you please get my attention? Yes, ma'am. Please come forward. Good evening. Um, I'm Norma Lund, and I'm representing Rio Ventana Townhomes, which is just east of the proposed um, improvement. And we did go to the public meeting that was at the hotel, and we um, hired an attorney to go, so it was costly for us to um, listen to the presentation. So today, we're, we're homeowners coming instead. Um, and I wanted to speak because I wanted the council to understand that um, or take into consideration before the January 10th meeting that this is not, you know, that wouldn't be our last opportunity to come forward with an attorney present then at that time. We appreciate the quality of the project. We want to say that straight up. Um, we live next door to Treehouse. We've had um, different um, engagements with them and the owners of uh, that owned the um, mobile homes that were there. It was a sad thing that did happen, but as we all understand, things change. Life changes, property changes. In Tempe, by far, is the greatest one of the greatest places of change in the state. Um, so we really do appreciate the quality because that helps us as current owners of a 46 unit development that was passed by the, by the city in 2002 um, come back and listen again on what is your emphasis now. 
because we see shortcomings in what was passed for us. So we want to make sure that our neighbor um, doesn't experience a lot of the shortcomings that we have. Um, <coughs> the landscaping improvement on the outside of this project is, is fabulous. Um, we want to, again, compliment <coughs> the developers. Um, the transportation improvements. We do have college students. And by far, let me tell you as how I got involved in there is my, or not my, our uh, child um, went to school at ASU. And we bought that property. And make no mistake to think or, or that you're not going to have a parent come in and say, oh, 310, 355, I can do that. They're going to be there four years. I know where they are. It's safe. It's um, close to school. Um, all the things that we, that we thought about when we, when we purchased. Um, and there are a lot of the same type of individuals in our community who have purchased. So that amount is not going to shy people away. Um, the transportation improvements on Smith Road. I am so happy to hear that you all are in an agreement that that needs to happen um, on both sides of university. Um, not just on the side that's being developed, but you know, where are those cars going to go straight? But to Tempe Marketplace. That's, I mean, my kids, you know, let's ride our bike, let's take the scooter, let's drive, whatever we got to do to get to Tempe Marketplace. Yeah, that's a, that's a good you know, so that's, you know, you, you really do need to take that into consideration. The HOA requirements, you don't see those um, owners do. I hope the developer really thinks about that. What's down the road on Real Salado? The Cubs. Do you don't think Chicago people want to come out here in the middle of winter? And at least, you know, I'll be out here for a month. I'll be out here for six weeks. I'll be out here for two months. When you were talking about Diablo Stadium, I'm a baseball fan. I understand Diablo. I understand that security. I really, really do. So I really want you to think about it when you think about what you require developers to sign on to, um, because that affects all of us, not just baseball fans, but down the road. And um, Rio Salado, that park and where the Cubs are, you drive by there now, and there's families there, and, there, and there's people. I mean, there's just people. It's a great uh, place to hang out. Um, so, you know, you need to think about how desirable this land is going to be, these projects are going to be. Or someone, I mean, I know crazy baseball people who just buy that condo and I'll just come for spring break. You know, there you go. Um, the units and the parking, that's one of our greatest distress. And when, I'm, when I heard you all talk about parking and um, the, the materials that you use, but also for the fact that if, you're, if you really are concerned about your environment, you're going to plant trees. You're going to have curbside and plant trees so that you can, you know, that you can go ahead and cut down on that pollution. And you don't walk out to your car and it's 150 degrees. You, I'm you're, sorry. You're out of time, but can you wrap up? I'll yes, I am. Second. That was Just it. Like, okay. so that was it. That was it. So, so there you. you go. But um, I appreciate the fact that you let me speak this, this evening. And... Um, we do look forward to that development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone else in the audience wishing to address us on this item? Could you get our attention? Seeing none, thank you. And again, thank you, Mr. Earl. See you next year. With that, we're going to go to our next items uh, scheduled for a second public hearing and final adoption. They will be considered now. Item 6C1 was read and introduced on December 13, 2018, and a vote will be taken tonight. And item 6C2 was read and introduced on November 29, 2018, and a vote will be taken as well. Item 6C1 is to hold a second and final public hearing to adopt an ordinance authorizing an underground right-of-way easement for electrical power supply purposes on city rights of way located uh, within the Rio Salada Parkway and First Street between Farmer Ave and Marina Heights and authorizing a city engineer or her designee to execute such uh, easement and related documents. 
This is a public hearing item. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to address us on item 6C1? Could you get my attention? Seeing none, is there a motion on item 6C1? So moved. Moved by Councilmember uh, Navarro. Is there a second? Second by Councilmember Adams. Please vote. Motion passes 7 to 0. Item 6C2 is to hold a second and final public hearing to adopt an ordinance for a zoning map amendment for the new overlay district and accompanying zoning and development code text amendment to establish development standards for Arizona State University Athletic Facilities District Planning Area uh, on approximately 276 acres. The applicant is Gamage and Burnham. Um, Ms. Vaz, would you like to make a statement? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, very briefly, for your record, my name is Angela Vaz, the law firm of Gamage and Burnham. I just wanted to talk, I won't go through the whole presentation, we talked about it uh, last time just quickly, but just wanted to mention there's two items that were brought up last time. One, uh, Councilman Member Granville asked that we uh, which we just do here, notify, add the council, and I am now adding the Community Development Department to our ordinance to be notified with the electronic notice we send out to the neighbors. So that has been done in the text amendment. So I just wanted to report that. And then also, as uh, Councilwoman Aragonda Savage asked, we've attached the uh, Novus Design Guidelines, the Street Safe streetscape standards to this agenda as an exhibit so that they are available on the web for anybody who would like to see kind of the design guidelines and the streetscape standards that will be addressed within uh, within Novus. So I'm happy to make a presentation or answer any questions as you like. Thank you. This is a public hearing item. Is there anyone in the audience wishing to address us on this item? Could you please get my attention? I'll make a motion to approve. Motion. There, motion. there is a motion. Uh, Councilmember Adams moved to approve item uh, 6C2. Is there a second? Councilmember Keating? Any further discussion? Please vote. That motion passes 7 to 0. Thank you. See you next year. <laughs> this sounds kind of funny. Long. But it's not. Um, okay, next item on our agenda is our current events and council announcements and future agenda items. Ms. Adams. Yes. Uh, are we putting it up on the? There you go. Okay. Uh, first is uh, registration is underway, and you can view a brochure of the many offerings that um, Tempe has to offer learning opportunities. And you can learn everything from uh, volleyball to dog obedience, which I'm thinking maybe I should attend with my new puppy. And it's a great way to meet your neighbors. So you go to www.tempe.gov uh, slash brochure, or you can phone 480-350-5200 uh, to sign up for classes. So I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, second is uh, I'm starting a series called Join Jennifer. And we're going to start on Wednesday, January 16th at Tempe Public Market. And I'm going to go to every single zip code in Tempe because Tempe is so diverse and I really want to make sure that I get everyone's perspective <coughs> and bring them back to council. We're going to be talking about streets, pub public safety, and development statuses, status at, of, um, of rural and Warner Roads. And that will be at Tempe Public Market will be the first one. Um, I also want to congratulate uh, Jerry Hart. Uh, I had the good fortune to work with, uh, with you for many years. And... You're just a great guy, and I really wish you the best. And we will still find you if we have questions. And finally, I would like to wish happy holidays to all and a special holiday wish to my family who is in town uh, from Nebraska, staying warm. Thank you. Councilmember Granville. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, two quick things. Number one, um, the registration, I believe, is just starting off. I don't have, a, I don't have slides. Sorry, I'm not that organized. Uh, for the polar plunge which is uh, underway now. So if you want to support a, a great cause and support those uh, that have d d uh, disabilities, it's a great way to do it. I think most of us, I think, have jumped in that water at least a few times. It is really cold, um, and it supports a great cause. Uh, second one is uh, our great staff has put together uh, Instagrammies. It's now in its second year, as I believe, uh, Mayor, I think you were one of the judges last year, as a matter of fact. Uh, and I know Councilmember Keating was at the awards ceremony with me last year, and the photos, if you haven't had a chance to see them, were you there as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm saying, yeah, were, I think we were all there just about. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, they're absolutely fantastic photos. If you want to see the ones that are currently underway, 
Uh, if you have Instagram, it's what the, the kids use. Uh, it's do a hashtag for Instagrammies19, and you'll see the hundreds, if not, it might even be thousands of photos now that people have submitted. Uh, and they are just phenomenal. And, uh, and I believe scoring and, oh, look, somebody's looking right now. It's cool. Uh, scoring and grading and all that's going to be happening in the next, I think, couple weeks. So they're, they're just amazing photos. Um, and I guess I'm, this is weird to say, uh, I would also say hello to my fiance, which is weird. At any rate, I recently got engaged. And so, uh, yeah, there you go. Hello, Ashley. Thanks. Vice Mayor Kubi. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I first wanted to talk about our annual um, point in time count, homeless count. I think we have a visual. <clears throat> yes, volunteers are needed. I think last year we had more volunteers than ever before. Over 80 volunteers came. It's an early morning. It starts at 5 a.m. Um, and maybe lasts until about noon. But it's so important that we do an actual real point in time count of our homeless population. It enables us to gain resources that we might not otherwise gain and, and acts, act, acts like a, a snapshot in time so we can see the extent of our problem in Tempe. And um, you'll just learn so much and you'll learn about our wonderful officers and how trusted they are by our homeless um, and our street neighbors because our, our police officers are so compassionate. Uh, so I urge you to sign up. There are two training sessions that will happen. You can go to um, tempe.gov slash ending homelessness and reach out to Kelly Denman, who is our new homeless solutions coordinator. But it's a really valuable, wonderful experience. I, I urge you to sign up. That's January 22nd, but please try and sign up now so we know what extent of our needs are. And then I wanted to give a quick word about um, a dear person that's departed this world is Dr. Judith Homer. She was a professor of psychology at ASU, and um, her colleagues, her friends, her family are mourning her loss. She passed away. Uh, she lost her, her, her fight cancer um, on Monday and um, passed away. She was a commissioner on our Family Justice Commission, and she was the former director of counseling for the Center Against Sexual Abuse and a member of ASU's task force that was established to address sexual violence on campus and she has helped I see I see you there Paul in the crowd and I see the sadness in your face she helped to help design uh, the Commission's um, strategic planning and was such an important contributor to our Commission and she'll be missed by her family her friends her colleagues at ASU and and the greater community we warn mourn and send our condolences to Dr. Judith Homer's family Councilman Navarro thank you mayor Thank you, Mayor. Go ahead and settle in. I got a list. Yeah, 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 Mr. Bull. Picture number one. Ah, uh, that's not me, is it? Holy season. Let's see. We're going to talk about the children. Where we got human services. Okay, I'm going to read them, and you can find them. Holiday season. Uh, <laughs> you can help our seniors, children, victims of violence, and working poor uh, by simply taking a survey online. Tempe Community Council wants your input on where to direct its funds. The, the uh, essay is a one-page survey with 11 questions. And uh, if you know what the great work TCA does, you might also get involved. So take the survey at tempecommunitycouncil.org by January 31st. Uh, let's see, here's your chance to see uh, Tempe from the high school point of view. Uh, students at Marcus Knees and Mountain Point Desert Vista Tempe High School are sharing pictures. Oh, there's a, <laughs> could be. Uh, pictures and interviews by uh, um, capturing people who live, work, and play in Tempe. Uh, the Humanes of Tempe exhibit at the Historic Museum runs from January 13th, and visit tempe.gov slash museum for more information. Uh, last thing, save this date, February, uh, Saturday, February 2nd, from 10 a.m. to noon at the Tempe Historic Library. I'm hosting uh, our opioid town hall. Opioid addiction is a national crisis that affects us all, and Tempe is taking the important strides to reduce the stigma and help people in our community through technology advocacy and partnerships with schools, hospitals, and health care providers. Come and learn on February 2nd about Tempe's research with Arizona State University and how our GIS mapping helps firefighters better use their resources to meet health care workers and emergency responders who help battle this addiction. For more informa information, tempe.gov backslash opioids. Uh, also, I have to say, uh, my wife told me to say I love her. She's in the audience. There she is. And then.
Yeah, why don't you just automatically? I was text to say that. Uh, and Jerry, we'll miss you. Working with you and your brother. I got two of you guys. It's awesome. So thank you for your service. Councilmember Arredondo Savage. Yes, I do have a couple of slides because that's how we roll. And the first one is, like I mentioned, I think last time, the railversary. Hard to read. Hard to uh, think that uh, light rail's been around for 10 years, but it has. So the railversary is Thursday, December 27th. And if you haven't ever ridden light rail, this is a great opportunity for you to go check it out because it's free. And if you want to go to a really fun event over at Talking Stick Resort Arena, um, you can certainly go over there on Thursday, December 27th in the early afternoon. There will be a lot of really fun, cool things for you to do. Um, another thing that Valley Metro was working on, we talked last time about Respect the Ride, and part of the Respecting the Ride is this new app um, that they have developed called Alert Valley Metro App. And it's a really good way to um, communicate with Valley Metro, let them know if you're uncomfortable, if you've got complaints or any comments that you want to share. And it's going to be a good way for them to be able to collect that data um, to make sure everybody's safe. And you can also call emergency 911 right there from the app too. So um, it's just a really good way. Some One of the things that they're working on when it comes to uh, respecting the ride. And then I know that's going to evolve into other things too. So download it if you have not If you ride the light, light rail, I know uh, Valley Metro wants to hear from you and your comments. And lastly, I know uh, Councilmember Granville brought it up, but here it is. Uh, freeze your pause for a cause. If you haven't done it, it's a really great cause. All the money uh, benefits our Tempe Adaptive Recreation Programs. Uh, so thank you to Team Asa for uh, their eighth annual polar plunge at the lakes. Now listen, I'm not really getting into jumping in the, that thing. That's not what I do, but the pre-plunge party, right up my alley. So silent auction at Spokes, uh, Friday, January 11th from 4.30 to 7 p.m. So uh, if you got an opportunity to do both, I highly encourage it. If you're a pre-plunger pre, pre like me, I will see you Friday um, afternoon over at Spokes. So again, Jerry Hart, you're the man. Thank you so much. And you've been just a wonderful asset to the city of Tempe. You're really going to be missed. Um, Thank you for everything that you've done for this community. I've really enjoyed working with you. So thank you for that. And uh, happy new year to everybody and happy holidays. Oh, yeah, I love you too to my husband. I guess I got to say that. He's not even watching, though. It doesn't matter. That's like brownie points. That's what we're keeping. Well, <laughs> well, first of all, I love all your spouses too. All right. <laughs> every, every single one of them. Every single one of them. <laughs> um, <clears throat> You know, I'd like, to, I'd like to thank Jerry, of course, for his service and congratulate him and, you know, job well done and we'll definitely miss you around here. Um, you know, I don't really have any announcements. This is what I would typically do my tradition of giving my unabridged life story uh, at the last council meeting of the year, but for the sake of time, um, you know, I'll just say happy holidays and happy new year to my colleagues. Happy holidays and happy new year to all Tempians and I hope that 2019 brings you Peace, love, and prosperity. Thank you. Yep. I, I'm going to close out. I want to wish my colleagues, uh, all the residents of Tempe, all the staff, a wonderful holiday season and happy new year, as well as happy Kwanzaa. I think it's the 26th day after Christmas. Um, and, and enjoy have the safe holidays uh, and enjoy your family and your friends. It's a time to be good. Make sure you're safe on the roads. Um, and also, I want to... Really congratulate and thank Jerry Hart for his service. Um, I, I've had the pleasure of working you, with you for many years, and we are a better community for your service. I know your family is proud of you. Enjoy your family and your time, especially with your mother, and uh, happy holidays to you and to everyone else. And look forward to a great 2019. See you guys all next year. We are adjourned that portion, but we do have one section left. It is our public appearances. We don't have any scheduled uh, appearances tonight, but I do have a couple cards for unscheduled public appearances. So according to the Arizona Open Meeting Law, the City Council may only discuss matters listed on this agenda. Matters discussed by the public during public appearances cannot be discussed by the City Council unless that item is specifically agendized. There is a three-minute time limit per speaker, and speaker's visual aids and recorded tapes are not allowed. Uh, members of the public shall refrain from making any personal, impertinent, or slanderous remarks or from becoming boisterous while addressing the city council or attending this meeting. Unauthorized remarks from the audience, clapping, stopping of feet, or any other similar demonstrations are also prohibited, and violations of these rules will result in the removal of the city council chambers. With that, I have two cards. One is Mr. Anderson, Clifford. <clears throat> Please state your name and 
place of residence of the record? <laughs> My name is Clifford Anderson, uh, 513 East Dairy Drive, Tempe. I've been a resident for 23 years, and I'm here to talk about smoke pollution from residential fires in Tempe. So this is a personal uh, problem for me. I have a problem breathing when there's um, wood fire smoke. I have a lot of problems in my neighborhood. Um, and when that happens, I, I can't keep the windows open. I can't go outside. Fire. I want to go ride my bicycle. And I've been a bike advocate for Tempe for many, many years, all pro bono, benefiting the community. And it's uh, very ironic that I can't go out and ride my bicycle tonight anymore. I can't go for runs from my house in the evenings. A lot of times in the morning, the smoke is still there in the morning when people are burned at night. I can't go in the running in the morning. I have to cancel workouts because the air is so bad in my neighborhood. It's unpredictable. I can't even tell where it's coming from. It's, it's really a problem for me. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm not the worst off. There are a lot of people who have asthma. A lot of children suffer and don't even know why. The elderly, people who have um, you know, COPD. And there, by one estimate, there are something like 2,000 uh, premature deaths annually in Arizona due to dirty air. Okay, and particulate matter is one of those issues there. So um, let, let me just put some facts out in front of you. So <coughs> smoke pollution is bad for human health. PM 2.5 is one metric. The EPA regulates PM 2.5 as well as PM 10. PM 10. The Maricopa Air Quality Department is the EPA approved primary quality assurance organization. So Maricopa County has a history of poor air quality in the winter. Residential fires are implicated in that. Tempe only has two of these sensors. This is managed by the county. So residential fires have a localized effect that can far exceed the average. For example, <coughs> my house. So smoke pollution is the tragedy of the commons. Individuals act in self-interest. They want the heat, but it's at the detriment of the community. And in Tempe, I think there is a very small minority of people who are actually the bad actors, people who are polluting the environment. And, and just as a, for those people who are responsible burners, three minutes of smoke is all that should come out. So there are a number of things the city can do. Um, and I just encourage you to um, look at starting a working group to address the issues of the smoke. There's already an ordinance in effect, so at, at the least, contact um, the, uh, the code compliance department and uh, ask them to accept complaints from the from residents about smoke. The ordinance is there. I've tried in the past. They don't. They won't accept the uh, any complaints. So, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Mr. Uh, Jeremy King. Good evening. This is my son Graham. I have a few things. I'm going to go fast. So, uh, I'm. I'm here on behalf of my friends and neighbors in the Tempe area. Obviously, you're, you're familiar with our situation. They just forced me out, so I don't actually live there now. I live just down the street. I still live in Tempe after 26 years and love it here. Uh, on Monday, we had a meeting with actually some of your staff who were disappointed to not see you all there. Hope you guys are feeling better or whatever was the reason you weren't able to come. Um, and so in that meeting, Mr. Jared Robinson offered to have us contact him, and there was about 10 witnesses there, uh, you know, for, you know, refunds or just, you know, to contact him. And I did the next day on email, and then yesterday he had the Tempe police call me that I was harassing him, okay? So the point of that is, is that these guys are out of control. Ask any of my neighbors there or any one of any of the Tides and, and Robinson managed properties. Um, and also, as of this afternoon, in that Monday meeting, Mr. Jared Robinson also said that they would have the hot water fixed for those folks in that community by the end of day Thursday. It still is not corrected. There's still no hot water there as of about 7.30, whenever I just had a text from one of my neighbors or former neighbors there. Um, also to note is the pattern of what they are doing uh, you, you know, turning out services to force people out is continuing on the north half of the Tides on Mill property. Some of my neighbors sent me a notice 
dead. To mention tonight that they are now turning off water or having water issues on the north boiler side of the Tides on Mill property. Buildings one through nine had the water off for a lot today. will be off tomorrow from what I understand. So please, the point again is for you guys just to, just to not let these guys go. You know, forget about me. I'm out of there or whatever. There's people in the Tides and Robinson Group managed properties all over the city that are suffering because of these guys. And as far as we can tell as residents for the last six weeks, they're going to get away with it. It's going to continue. If I leave the city or any of their properties, it's not going to go away. Okay, we're asking you all to do as much as you possibly can, and I know you are, obviously. Thank you for sending Mr. Weaver and Mr. Methvin and Ms. Fisher to that meeting on Monday. Don't let up. Don't take your eye off of these guys, okay? Uh, continuing on, uh, you know, obviously, the, the whole thing is transparency and accountability, right? And obviously, you saw my email, Ms. QB, that you sent to me that I responded to those things about if they're complying with those. Don't take my word for it. Go check yourself. Go talk to people that are still there. Um, and that's it. You know, again, it's all about accountability and transparency and transparency with the city, Robinson, and the tenants of their properties. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. Uh, this is the public hearing, uh, a section for public comments unscheduled. Is there anyone else in the audience wishing to address us? Could you please get our attention? Seeing none, with that, we are adjourned. Happy holidays and happy new year. Be safe, boys. Yeah.